Kicking off the list at number 10, the ring of Sekinianus. One ring to rule them all. And by rule, I mean curse you and your entire family for ages to come. Yeah, this 12 gram gold ring for starters was massive. It was beautiful. Its diameter was 25 millimeters. So unless you were wearing some mighty gauntlet, she might slip off. Big old ring. It's like a big onion ring, but a little bit, a little bit more haunting. The ring had first been found in 1785. A farmer was plowing a field in Silchester Village, which is a village west of London, known for its, you know, grim history, as are most of these things on this list. In 45 AD, ancient Romans invaded that site, and come the seventh century, it was completely abandoned. No one was left there. The ring was mighty. It had an inscription on it as well, a Latin inscription. Of course, always Latin. It read, Sedecion vivas in diem. When 1929 rolled around, new details surfaced, or resurfaced, rather. The data from the ring matched an excavation that was done in the early 1900s, less than 100 miles away, a place called Lindney. That's where this ring is from. That's the OG. That's the OG site. At the same site, however, a tablet was found recalling the Celtic god of healing and hunting and how his favorite gold ring was stolen. In case you're wondering why this rings a bell, Lord of the Rings was inspired by this legend. The tablet also says, may he who bears the name of Senechianus not have health until he brings the ring back to the Temple of Nodens. So, if you've got it, Let's go. Number nine, the Crystal Skull. Honestly, I'm surprised we haven't talked about this more. A lot of Mesoamerican stuff today, but damn, they got a lot of curses and jinxes on all their stuff. And in reality, that's not fair. All a guy wants to do is loot and pillage other civilizations' treasures, just like my ancestors before me. Nice. Yeah, maybe. Well, besides being the second worst Indiana Jones movie, yeah, I said it, I like that one better than the Temple of Doom. Now, if you didn't sit through an hour of Shia LaBeouf, and honestly, I don't blame you, basically the skulls are like a Pokemon or Dragon Balls. You gotta, you gotta catch them all. Only then, you will receive a wish where a ghostly outworldish creature will grant you said wish. In other words, this is what a weekend at Vanessa's Hudgens house looks like. I don't know, she said she can talk to ghosts, so. The only ghouls that she's talking to are the people who think High School Musical holds up as a theatrical release. Seriously, try watching that movie now without cringing yourself into the bottom of a liquor bottle. Speaking of ghosts and liquor, you can buy alcohol in the shape of a crystal skull because we are modern humans and we don't take ancient warnings very seriously. We will probably feel the wrath of the crystal skull, all thanks to a Canadian Ghostbuster. Number 8. Pompeii Artifacts Once a thriving beautiful city in ancient Rome, Pompeii was sadly destroyed in 79 AD. This time it wasn't humans responsible for the massive loss of life. What do you know? It was actually Mother nature this time around. Hmm, she got one. Nice. The eruption of Vesuvius buried the ancient city in volcanic ash. Thank you, it took nine tries. Little do you know, viewer. Excavation didn't begin until much later, during the 18th century, and after a century of careful excavations, the city was finally reopened again to the public. Finally. Yeah, just the place you want to go. Hey! Every year there's many reports of lootings, locals, tourists, you name it, everyone wants to steal a little piece of Pompeii, literally a little mm, just in their pocket. Yeah, as if raining volcanic ash wasn't bad enough, now there's thousands of people literally stealing your land. Piece by piece. Pompeii archaeological superintendents get over 100 packages a year of said stolen fragments. They return them. Yeah, thieves will send the artifact back with a little note explaining how sorry they are and how it's caused extreme bad luck in the household. Again, might have something to do with the fact that you're a thief, but hey, who knows? <laughs> Maybe it's that one time. That's why your marriage failed. Number seven, the pharaohs of Egypt. It was said that any thieves who dare enter or disturb the slumber of the deceased kings shall be cursed and perish. Well, this applies to archaeologists too, unfortunately. Howard Carter, the famed archaeologist, and his team back in the 1920s had come across the discovery of a lifetime finding the tomb of King Tutankhamun. You probably heard of him. And kickstarting the study of Egyptology. For anyone in the sciences out there, you know how exciting this is. Trouble is, some folks on Howard Carter's team started to feel a little under the weather. Maybe it was all the excitement from their discovery. Maybe it was the hot African sun and the dry desert. Or maybe it was the curse of the Egyptian pharaohs. As some men on his team perished from blood diseases. That's just not okay. So what's the lesson here? Maybe leave these places alone before it starts raining frogs? Huh? Think about it. I don't want that. Number six, the Koh-i-Noor diamond. 
Another list, another cursed diamond. Here we go, buckle up. The Koh i Noor diamond translates to Mountain of Light in Persian, which sounds beautiful, but all that glitters is not gold. A Hindu legend says those who wear the diamond will own the world, but will also know all its misfortunes. 186 carats, this thing was a pure beauty. Of course, it was passed ruler to ruler, century after century at that point. The earliest account actually is 1628. The diamond was first in the possession of Mughal ruler Shah Jahan. But once his own son had him imprisoned, the diamond later went to Iranian ruler come 17th. Nadir Shah invaded, taking countless lives, as well as the Koh i Noor diamond, all their jewels for that matter, not just the one. It was horrible, but later on, he was taken out by 15 of his own officers while he was asleep. Come the 18th century, Queen Victoria had possession of the diamond after being used in the Treaty of Lahore, but Queen Victoria wasn't a fan of the shape. Yeah, she's like, eh, it doesn't really fit with my gauntlet to snap people away. So she had it recut. So now it's only 105 carats, it's a little smaller, but it's still beautiful. Since then, the diamond has only been worn by British royal women or else we'll explode. Number five, Nazca Lines. Imagine the confusion the first pilots, airmen, or anyone who got a good vantage point in the Peruvian desert, and to their surprise, discover some illustrations in the ground. Except, you know, they're, they're massive and no one knows who the heck drew them. Or at least its origins. Obviously it was done by some sort of ancient tribe or civilization, sure, but the grade school process of thought isn't answered. And if you remember, then you remember. You know what I'm talking about. Your, your five W's. Your who, what, where, when, why, and sometimes how. I almost forgot how to count there. That dyslexia is a heck of a thing. I mean, I know how they dug these bad boys in the sand, but hear me out. In those times, there's no planes. The only way you'd be able to see them is on the surrounding foothills. But there's no evidence that these people live close to those drawings, so who were they made for? Gods? Extraterrestrials? The weird guy with the weird hair on the History Channel would tell you so. All I'm gonna say is, anything that's meant for gods and aliens, they meant for us. So keep, keep an eye out in space there, keep an eye out. Number four, Ballista Balls. I'm not sure if you picked this up yet, but uh, don't take things that don't belong to you. Great, hit the, hit the thumbs up for that common knowledge we should all have. Whether you believe in curses or not, leave things alone, and people for that matter, okay? If you want to learn more about Roman artillery, that's why we're here. Don't steal 6th century weaponry, ever. It's a bad idea. Back in 1989, an archaeological team was brushing up the past near Israeli-Syrian borders, and the remains of an ancient Roman ballista, a massive crossbow, were found. It's exciting, but here comes the bad stuff. Six years later, researchers found ballista balls, which were sadly the ammo when it came to these massive war machines. And in 2015, these balls appeared in a courtyard outside of a museum in Israel, written from an anonymous thief, imploring others to never touch those stone balls or take them. As you know, they're, they're cursed. They're all cursed, apparently, full of bad luck. His family apparently left him, this thief, and he had to sell everything he possessed in order to just get by, including those ballista balls. He was gonna sell them and he's like, you know what, no. That's the last thing I own, I'm putting it back. Could be a curse, again, or the fact that he was the thief. Either or, both not great. Number three, Montezuma's Revenge. Yes, that's right, Montezuma's Revenge. A traveler's worst nightmare. I too have succumbed to the horrors of Montezuma's Revenge. And it's always when I gotta do something important, like on a movie set, or with a group of people I'm really trying to impress, especially career-wise. So the rule is that no pickled vacaccini peppers before a critical event. However, I'm talking about a different kind of Montezuma's revenge, not the bathroom kind. I'm talking about his gold. I'm talking about when Hernan Cortez and the Conquistadors destroyed the Aztec Empire. Montezuma cursed them. And that applies to his lost gold as well. Which in case you didn't know, the Spanish were after. It's pretty much all they were after. So if Montezuma can curse your family trip to Cancun, then surely he can curse a pile of his own gold and jewels. After some were dumped in the lake and others in the desert, I just wouldn't exactly be so excited to go find it. You don't know what, I'm, what might happen if you do. If he can give you diarrhea, maybe he can give you vomiting. You don't know. You don't know. I'm pointing a lot in this video. And number two, ancient mirror. It doesn't matter who you are, you've heard of this curse before. Maybe you have it. Maybe you're experiencing this curse right now, I hope not. You break a mirror and what do you get? You get seven years of bad luck. Has this happened to you ever? If so, what year are you on? I'm on four myself. How close are you to the seven year mark? Cause we got your back, okay? Ancient Romans believed that the human soul would renew every seven years. That's where the seven year thing comes into play. It's where it all started. It takes time to repair the human soul, right? Combined with the belief that mirror's reflection was the only way into the soul, well, now we have one dude in history who feels really bad for breaking the first ever mirror. Therefore, a curse has lived on. If you break a mirror, you're tearing the soul from the body and now you're abandoning it. In Kazakhstan, if you break a mirror, evil spirits 
will haunt the person responsible for the damage. That's a pretty horrible deal. They say you can't look into a broken mirror afterwards, like once it shatters into a bunch of pieces, because that's bad luck as well. So if you break a mirror, you just gotta do nothing about it, I guess. You just gotta be like, Ah, okay. And sweep without looking. There's too many mirrors now. I'm like cut to today. I'm sure ancient Romans had no idea what 2022 would look like. We have phone cases with mirrors on them. We're literally surrounded by mirrors. I broke a studio mirror, a dance studio mirror once. Am I doomed? I feel like I'm doomed. Number one, vampire burial. If you couldn't tell, I get a lot of my knowledge from movies, TV, and video games. It's just what raised me. That's how it goes. So you can't blame me when my knowledge of vampires comes from Skyrim and the hit young adult romance novels Twilight. You know what I'm saying? However, what I do know is that they have sharp teeth. They don't like garlic and will cease to exist if you drive a wooden stake through their heart. However, that's kind of a moot point, as most things would not work anymore if you did that. I know I wouldn't. Some folks in Poland a few hundred years ago were not taking any chances, however. Remains found in Kaldus, Poland were that of anti-vampire graves. Basically, you bury the vampires and you leave a wooden stake in their heart just in case it wants to wake up and eat you or do whatever they do at night. I don't know, blah, 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 some of that stuff. Or remove their head entirely. No wooden stake, no problem. Just toss a couple small boulders into the hole. That way, the bloodthirsty menace can't get people. You know, boy, people in the past were so kind. That's so nice. Number 10, the Anguish Man. I don't care who you are, but every family out there has one artifact or one heirloom in their house that just doesn't sit well with you. Please comment below and let us know. I'm, I'm actually very curious to see what it is. For me, it was a dancing Halloween skull with moss and black roses coming out of its eyes, playing the classic funeral song. I don't know what you call it, but you know what I'm talking about. Speaking of funerals, that's probably where the Anguish Man came from. I'm just taking a guess. The Anguish Man is a painting of a man in anguish, or some sort of distress, and I'm not just saying this to be funny, but the painting is 100% bona fide scary. What's more unusual than that is that no one is sure of its origin or creator. The current owner of the painting says he got it from his grandmother, and the knowledge train stops there. No one knows where it came from. And seriously, look at it. It's scary. It's terrifying. I don't like it. I'm gonna walk off now. It's scared. Number nine, the goddess of death statue. Well, that's quite the name. Okay, let's talk about it, shall we? For starters, it doesn't look like anything menacing, which makes the tail that much more convincing, if anything. It looks like one of those crazy bones. Remember crazy bones from the late 90s? So good, I had all of them. Put them in my mouth all the time, weirdly. It's like the suck on some crazy bones. This cursed ancient statue from 3500 BC was unearthed at Lempa, Cyprus back in 1878. The limestone was dated quite a while back, and the statue, as far as origins go, is a complete mystery. But many historians believe that it was once a fertility statue, or it represented a goddess whose name has now been lost in time. The statue has gone through numerous families with tragedy following closely behind. Hence the, you know, curse aspect of his list. Lord Elephant had the statue for around six years, and during that time, all seven of his family members bit the bullet. Second owner, Ivor Minucci, same thing, entire family just wiped out, this time only within four years. Lord Thompson Noel, entire family, also four years. And then finally, the statue had belonged to the late Sir Alan Biverbrook and his family. And you can probably guess what happened within a few years. Number eight, cursed amethyst. A beautiful purple amethyst stolen from India, worth a fortune and would make an excellent addition to any jewelry collection. Trouble is, there may be something wrong with this gorgeous gem. Cursed, that is. The first gentleman to appropriate this gem quickly became ill afterwards and passed away. The gem was then given to his son, who also became ill and croaked. The gem kept passing hands as the story goes on, until it came to the possession of a man named Edward Heron Allen, who was so convinced of the gem's dark powers, he stored it in a bank vault and put it in seven lockboxes, just to make sure. It's kind of like the babushka doll from hell. He also left strict instructions to take out the gem 33 years exactly to the day that he put it in, and a warning for anyone who dares possess such an item. It now sits in the Museum of Natural History. I'll keep my distance, thank you very much. Number seven, the baker's wedding dress. Why is it in so many horror films the ghost is always a lady floating around in a white wedding dress? Mix it up a little, I don't know. Maybe a bridesmaid's gown wouldn't hurt. Maybe something red, something with a little pizzazz on it, I don't know. Been watching a lot of RuPaul's Drag Race. 
Throw, a, throw, throw some glitter on something, I don't know. They're always taken out before their wedding night, it seems. Or apparently they're taken out over a vase. Back in 1849 in the small town of Atuna, Pennsylvania, Elliot Baker and his wife Hetty lived in the Baker Mansion. They had two sons, one daughter, Anna Baker. Anna had fallen in love with one of her father's employees, another steel worker, but her father wouldn't allow the relationship to really, you know, take off. Anna vowed to never marry again and she locked herself in her room. When her father passed away in 1848, she went to go find her true love, but he had since settled down. So she spent the rest of her days behaving erratically, you know? She was upset, rightfully so. Her father didn't let her have her true love. And now her soul still haunts that same wedding dress today. Not just the dress too, the mansion is haunted as well. And guests would report furniture and vases moving around all the time. That's not bad as far as hauntings go. You ask me, moving couches? That'd be great, I have a bad back. I would love some help, really, thank you. Anna, grab the side, let's go, one, two, three. Number six, The Crying Boy. Another painting, I know, but this one is extra creepy. So basically, there's this very popular print of a painting. It's a boy, he's crying. Oh, I know, who would want that though, seriously? There's different versions of it, but originally done by Bruno Armilio. Well, we don't talk about Bruno because his painting had some serious creep factor going on. Besides the fact that it's a crying young man who's peering into the very depths of your soul, firefighters began to notice a pattern when putting out house fires. There's a connection here, hold on, stay tuned. No smoke alarms, leaving the stove unattended, and this painting were common. I wonder why, except the painting was never damaged in any of these fires. And after putting out a few houses, and the same painting keeps showing up and keeps surviving the said fires, that's strange, hmm, that's weird. As it turns out, the print had flame retardant chemicals in its production, thus protecting it. Maybe just don't bring it inside though. Number five, the Hope Diamond. Coming from the 1660s, this curse began when a gem dealer named Jean Baptiste Tavernier bought this large diamond when visiting India. He bought it with his, with his earned money, with his money, okay? Remember that. The origins of the diamond were unknown, but it didn't matter. This beauty was just sitting there and he had to throw all the cash in it. He had to buy it with all of his money. For sure, the money that he had. Well, later on, after Tavernier got the diamond, rumors spread throughout Europe and the United States that he actually stole the diamond from the statue of a Hindu goddess. He didn't actually buy it. Yeah, little different than his story. Sadly, more believable too. The newspapers actually kicked this one off by publishing the Hope Diamond as an ancient curse. The diamond at one point ended up in the hands of King Louis XVI and his wife, Marie Antoinette. Well, if you don't know about them, they were, uh, they lost their, you know, they died. They lost their lives during the French Revolution, let's just say that, the old guillotine dream team. The stone then went to Lord Francis Hope come 1839, and by that point it was deemed cursed for real, hence the Hope Diamond name. They ended up selling the diamond shortly after being reduced to poverty, and then Evelyn Walsh McLean bought the stone in 1912. Shortly after, her son was killed in a car accident, and when the stone was delivered to its final and current home, the Smithsonian, back in 1958, the driver delivering the package was later hit by a truck. He survived, but shortly after this, his house caught fire. Moral of the story, you don't need diamonds, for more reasons than one. Number four, crude oil. Before anyone jumps all over me and says, but Chetty, I love crude oil because it provides jobs and economy. That's true, you're right, and there's probably gonna be someone else saying that without crude oil and gasoline, how can they keep up their lifestyle? I need gas for my sedan, pickup truck, SUV, RV, dirt bike, quad bike, go-kart, speedboat, my John Deere, lawn equipment. All this is true, and as a big dude, I appreciate the automobile just as much as the next guy. I ain't walking. However, one cannot deny the amount of trouble oil has caused folks in the last 100 years. Name a place with oil and there's probably someone foaming at the mouth trying to get their hands on it. You can go either way on this one, really. All I know is that I'm not the emperor of an evil empire looking for oil. Or am I? Number three, the Busby Stoop Chair. The Busby Stoop Chair comes from 1702. So right off the bat, this legend kicked off only 10 years after the Salem Witch Trials. So take this one with a grain of salt, please. People made odd choices at this time. They kind of believed anything, you know, women were witches, chairs were haunted. Welcome to 1702, I guess. Englishman Thomas Busby had some issues with his father-in-law. He didn't handle those issues well and he had to be hanged for it. Yeah, you can't just kill people for no reason, Thomas. What is it, 1701? That's crazy. He was hanged near the Humble Inn, ironic name, but a chair that was nearby during said hanging is now said to hold the spirit of one Thomas Busby. So legend has it, if you sit on this chair or if you put your knee on it or whatever, you are set to die in a frightful accident. A frightful accident, big chair, could you imagine? You sat in that chair, now you're gonna your pants at work. No! <laughs> That's it. God forbid you needed to tie your shoelace at the Humble Inn. Oh, uh, the horrors, the horrors. So the chair was declared haunted. The chair was declared haunted. But did anything actually happen afterwards? Yeah, honestly. 
Sounds silly, but this was the real deal, I guess. Locals say during World War II, airmen from a nearby base came to the pub and those who sat in the Busby chair have never returned. Again, could have had something to do with the war, but let's continue. Then in the late 70s, more accidents were connected, but they still kept the chair around until 1798. They're like, eh, it's haunted, but it looks nice, you know? It matches the wall. It stayed at the inn for that long, and then it was donated to the Thirst Museum. So if you feel like checking out some haunted chairs, there you go, freaks. Number two, Capuchin Crypt. Hey, I get it. In the past, there were no home renovators. You couldn't walk into your favorite big box home renovation store and pick out some great additions for interior design. Well, some guys in Rome thought their church was a little underwhelming. They wanted something that made a statement, something bold, something macabre. The Church of Santa Maria in Rome, and it has a longer name, but it's not dyslexia friendly, so I'm not gonna pronounce it, is a church that's decorated with skulls and bones arranged in tasteful art pieces, lining the walls and archways with bones look like designs. And one room having some mummified monks and a wall full of skulls to comfort, Churchgoers, oh god. I can just imagine what a room full of old bones smells like. Oh, no thank you. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be sick. Oh. And number one, the Great Bed of Ware. Yeah, let's get nice and cozy for this last one. When putting this list together, Big Chet and I both agreed that Haunted or Not, this is a bed we would both have, for sure. It's massive, it's cozy, it caught our eye. It looks like a bed a king would sleep in, and rightfully so. The Great Bed of Ware was built for the royal family back in 1463. It was 12 feet by 12 feet. Plenty of space to cut your toenails, whatever you want to do. Yeah, just brush them off. You got like 11 more feet to work with. You're good. It's a big bed. What a time. Jonas Fosbrook, a carpenter from the time, impressed King Edward IV with his work. The king gave him a pension for life all because of this bed. That's how good it was. Over time, the bed became property of the Lord of Ware Manor, a man named Thomas Fanshaw. People would travel all across the land to see this beauty. That's a fun family vacation. Hey, let's go see this bed. I heard it's a neat bed. Pack your stuff. Shakespeare mentioned it in the Twelfth Night, it was a big deal, but all those who stayed in the bed did not have a good night's rest. Rather, they woke up to scratches and bruises, it was horrible. That is, if they got enough sleep to begin with. People would wake up on the floor. Somehow they would roll out of a 12-foot bed. That's crazy. Today it can be found in the Victoria and Albert Museum, so if you want to go cuddle up, there you go. At number 10, First Americans. 2021 brought us a lot of new discoveries. The study of ancient humans gained more information with the discoveries made last year. One of the bizarre finds from last year include footprints that are believed to have belonged to some of the first people to set foot in America. These footprints were discovered in muddy earth at the edge of a wetland in New Mexico and were very well preserved. After some research was done, it was found that these footprints were made somewhere between 21,000 and 23,000 years ago, which greatly pushes back the timeline of when humans came to the Americas, the last continent to be settled by humans. Up until this point, it was believed that the first humans arrived in the Americas around 13,000 years ago, at the end of the last ice age. These footprints, which are believed to have been made by children, have scientists thinking that these humans migrated to the area during a time where sheets of ice blocked the passage to North America, indicating that they were there much earlier than previously thought. And number 9, Dragon Man. Now, even though the name might not suggest it, no, this is not a half-man, half-dragon, but it's still a strange discovery. This past summer, scientists discovered the skull of this new human species that they've named Homo longi, longi being the Chinese name for dragon, and dragon being a reference to the location that these remains were found since they were discovered by the Dragon River region in northeast China. The skull of the dragon man dates back 146,000 years, and scientists believe that this new species belongs to another sister group of the Homo sapiens, so they're even more closely related to us than Neanderthals. What stunned researchers the most about this incredible find was the size of this being's skull because it was pretty big for a hominid from this time. This find opened a new avenue of discoveries for scientists, so that's exciting news for anyone who takes an interest in this sort of thing. I mean, with further research, who knows what we could learn from this find. Before we carry on talking about some more of these strange discoveries, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Ancient Fashion. In 2021, archaeologists made a discovery that gives us an idea of how ancient humans made clothing. It was always assumed that ancient humans used animal furs for clothing, but up until recently, not much was known about their fashion. With this newest find, scientists were able to figure out how clothing was made all those thousands of years ago. 62 bone tools were found in Morocco, and it's believed that they were used to process and smooth animal skins. This find may be the earliest evidence for clothing in the archaeological record 
records. The bone tools that were found are believed to be between 90,000 and 120,000 years old and were used to work leather. What's fascinating about this find is the fact that similar bone tools are still used by leather workers even to this day, so it's cool to know that our ways haven't changed much over the years. At number 7, Gobekli Tepe. The Neolithic era was the final period of the Stone Age where early humans began the process of domestication of animals and agriculture. For a long time, scientists believed that this era gave way to the process of holding rituals and creating monuments to their beliefs. But with the remarkable discovery of Gobekli Tepe, that entire idea was rewritten as this mysterious site suggested that early hunter-gatherers made this temple as a ritualistic center far before these individuals decided to create settlements and begin the agricultural revolution. Based on evidence found at this site that dates 6,000 years older than Stonehenge, groups of hunter-gatherers came to this site in Urfa, Turkey some 11,500 years ago and carved out this ritualistic site out of the limestone that covered the area. It is believed that Gobekli Tepe was just a stopping point for these early humans. It was a place to meet, hold feasts, and then leave again. Soon enough though, the desire to regularly hold these gatherings prompted the early humans to domesticate plants and animals to have a more dependable food source. So with this in mind, it is believed that these rituals are what gave way to the agricultural revolution, not the other way around. If you've seen any content regarding Gobekli Tepe, then you would know how eerie and mysterious this site looks, and because it's so old, it holds so many secrets that we have yet to uncover. At number 6, Cave Paintings I think that out of all the things left behind by our ancient ancestors, cave paintings are one of the most bizarre. So many archaic art pieces have been found by scientists over the years, from statues to ceremonial pieces, but cave paintings are by far the most fascinating, at least in my opinion. Much like modern art, it is all up to interpretation, especially since the artists who created these cave masterpieces are long gone. Some of the most mysterious cave paintings are those that depict some kind of alien life forms. Yep, I said aliens. Even back in the days of the early humans, homo sapiens have been looking to the stars or even having their own encounters with extraterrestrials. One such depiction of alien life comes from the Wangina cave paintings. These eerie looking paintings depict these sky beings as they were called. These beings are depicted with white faces, devoid of a mouth, large black eyes, and a head surrounded by a halo or some kind of helmet. According to legend, the Wangina were sky people or spirits from the sky who descended from the Milky Way and created Earth and all of its inhabitants. The Wangina realized how big a task their creation was, and so they sent for more of their people and spent their time creating, teaching, and being gods to the people of Earth. Eventually they left, either descending into the water or returning back into the stars. This extraterrestrial discovery has to be one of the most bizarre finds from our ancient ancestors. At number 5, Mass Extinction this one might be a little sad because we're going to talk about how scientists determined just how much destruction humans caused in the early days of humanity. While humans were evolving in Africa, the rest of the world's creatures were thriving for the most part. In many parts of the world untouched by human influence, there were megafauna. These megafauna were able to live and thrive for thousands of years, at least until Homo sapiens came along and ruined everything. As we started to traverse the globe, creating settlements and beginning the story of humanity, we we also, in the process, killed off most of this megafauna, causing a mass extinction of these creatures. This extinction event, which scientists have called the Holocene extinction, is still ongoing. Most of the largest animals to have ever roamed the Earth were wiped out around 80,000 years ago and went completely extinct by 10,000 years ago. Some scientists want to blame this on climate change, however, in a lot of places, the timing of the first human settlements and the extinction of certain animals line up too precisely to completely excuse us from having caused damage to Earth's megafauna. At number 4, Baby Burial Though it can be really sad, finding ancient burial sites can give researchers a lot of information about the culture of certain groups of ancient people. At a 34,000 year old hunter gatherer burial site near Moscow, archaeologists discovered the remains of two adolescent boys and what they found alongside the remains was surprising. These two boys who looked to have had some kind of disability were buried like royalty. They were buried together along with 10,000 mammoth beads, more than 20 armbands, 
around 300 pierced fox teeth, 16 ivory mammoth spears, carvings, antlers, and human fibula laid across the chest of each child. Compared to the other adult burial sites, this one was quite lavish, but the reason as to why these two were buried with so much care is unknown. It is one of those mysteries from our history that remains unsolved, making it a bit of a bizarre find. At number 3, Old Settlement. In an area of Kenya called Panga Ya Saidi, archaeologists discovered a network of caves that are believed to have housed hundreds of people. This cave area houses more than a thousand square feet of space, and it is believed that an ancient tribe used to call this place home. Inside this cave, archaeologists also discovered a collection of various stone tools that date back around 67,000 years. This was the ideal living arrangement for the ancient people who used to live there because the tropical climate of the area would have been good for survival, whereas other areas of Africa would have experienced drought. This discovery just helped further our understanding of how the early humans lived. At number 2, Homo floresiensis. Here's a really interesting species of human that has recently been discovered. Homo floresiensis, nicknamed the Hobbit, were ancient hominids who lived in Indonesia around 100,000 to 50,000 years ago, and as you could probably guess by its nickname, these ancient humans were very small. It is estimated that they only stood about 3 foot 6 on average and weighed just over 60 pounds. Homo floresiensis also had tiny brains, large teeth, shrugged forward shoulders, had no chins, and had receding foreheads. So they definitely did not look like the rest of us humans. So far, Far, the remains of these humans have only been found on the island of Flores, Indonesia, and because of that, scientists believe that this species of human was subjected to island dwarfism, an evolutionary process that occurs from long-term isolation on an island with limited food. This island also has pygmy elephants, who are also extinct. What's pretty cool though is that scientists are currently exploring new evidence that might suggest that Homo floresiensis might have already been small before arriving to the island. And finally at number 1, Ancient Music. When you think about ancient humans, you might not associate them with art or music as they were quite primitive, but it turns out that some of our human ancestors were quite musically inclined. Years back, scientists discovered the first evidence of musical instruments in Germany and Slovakia. In 2008, archaeologists in Germany found flutes made from mammoth ivory that date back around 40,000 years ago, and just a few years before that, in 1995 in Slovakia, researchers found other flutes made from the thigh bones of cave bears which dated back Back around 60,000 years. These Slovakian flutes were the oldest musical instruments ever found, and they were made by Neanderthals. This opened up a whole new world of discovery for scientists, as this find suggested that these ancient people were able to comprehend concepts like rhythm, tempo, and melody. This also suggested that Neanderthals were much more intelligent and sophisticated than we thought. Number 10. Sacred books. The Romans paved the way for many following civilizations. Okay, they invented surgical tools, they invented medicine on the battlefield, and before this era, literature took the form of a tablet or a scroll. The Romans, they created the codex. Pages stacked on top of one another, just bound pages. The reason you have homework right now to be doing instead of watching this. It's all thanks to the ancient Romans. The early codex was bound wax, and then it moved to animal skin. This was a big step because early Christians used this new invention to produce copies of the Bible. Important pieces of history, so rightfully so, they had to be locked away from the public. Now back when King Tarkin ruled Rome, a local woman offered the Etruscan king nine books. Now these books were ignored at first, but upon a second glance, the beat up manuscripts foretold the rise and fall of Rome. So for most of its time, these spoiler filled manuscripts were held in the Temple of Jupiter. So if anybody wants to do National Treasure 3, I have some ideas, just saying. We could do like nine installments. And number nine, corrupt fire department. Oh, here we go. When we think back to ancient times, it's not long before we come across an ancient blaze or some ancient wild tragedy where you're like, oh my God, how did that even happen? Something that reminds you that it wasn't always a party, okay? It was rarely a party, in fact. When we think of Julius Caesar when regarding the leadership of Rome, we often forget Marcus Crossus. He was powerful and full of bright ideas on the sidelines. Marcus ran the fire brigade. A lot of open fires, a lot of accidents happened at this time, so of course we need responders. But back then, these officials arrived on site to this blazing emergency, but before helping out, Crossus would demand the owner sells their property to him first. Yeah, watch it burn or sell it for a not so handsome price. The choice is yours. And also you have 38 seconds to decide. TikTok. Number eight, ancient drag. I'll respect a girl's night out, okay? Always, I get it. My guy friends have ruined most nights out that I've had in the city. Cause guys are dumbasses. 
That's a fact. Ancient Romans were ahead of the game with this one as well. That's why they made the festival of the good goddess women only. Yeah, statues of men weren't even allowed to partake. Statues depicting men at this festival had to be draped. Yeah, none of us were seeing anything. But then in comes Mr. Jealous, Mr. Ancient FOMO himself. Enter Publius Clodius Pulcher, okay? This man disguised himself as a flute lady, but when he didn't play the flute, and also wasn't a lady, and also nobody knew him, it was a little obvious that an intruder was present. A trial soon followed and the festival was then suspended. See, guys ruin the party, even in ancient Roman days. This dude's like, nah, I'm gonna go ruin it. Number seven, sewer goddess. I love reading about ancient gods. It's my favorite topic. The Roman god of manure and fertilizer, for example. Where was that one in Hades? That would have been helpful. I would have beat that game in eight minutes flat with him. The god of toilets. There's one we can't forget about either. Crepitus, okay? Every day we have to thank the god of toilets, right? If you haven't today, Go ahead and thank them. The Romans regarded Glossina as the goddess of the main drain. The literal main drain to the city of Rome. All this water. This goddess was Gloca Maximum, aka Big Drain. Eventually this god was affiliated with Venus, the goddess of beauty and love. Yeah, love me some big ass drains. Nice. That's a lie actually. As a kid I was so afraid of the bathtub drain. I would pull it and then just immediately high jump out of the tub. I don't want to get sucked down like Ant-Man. Know what I mean? Number six, death before combat. With most of these Roman gladiators, they're trained, they understand a specific style of combat, and they're paired with an opponent that's somewhat equal. And then hundreds of people go, yeah, and they bet on you, and then see you blood and stuff. It's horrible. But not all these gladiators are UFC fighters, okay? Not all of them are Kurt Russell and handsome. No, a great amount of these gladiators were criminals who were forced to fight each other in the name of entertainment, or they were slaves. Yeah, these prisoners of war were not really on board with fighting a lion with a dagger, believe it or not. They understood this was a one-way trip, most likely, so many of them took their own lives before the combat even begun. This one story is quite haunting, but it makes total sense, sadly. 29 prisoners, they were all set to fight these crazy animal battles in front of thousands, but they all strangled each other. They all took each other's lives with their bare hands because that was easier to them than walking into this nightmare publicly. That's horrible. The reason this was the easier choice to make, sadly, was because saying no to the combat or to the games would just lead to an even more painful public execution. So, it's a lose-lose, sadly. They sucked. Number five, loincloths. Going back to ancient Roman and Egyptian times, here we go, two for one, the loincloth was of course used by all. Either that or you would just be naked. I found this neat step-by-step -step on how to make your own loincloth, and I tried it, and it's way more complicated than I could have ever imagined, okay? We don't have a lot of archaeological evidence because these linens barely made it through a decade, obviously. There's not a lot of bones in them that would hang out over these thousands of years. But ancient Romans would often use leather to make underwear. Can you imagine that? Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the sun? Oh, I need baby powder, just thinking about it right now. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments and, you know, zippers and stuff, but that's that's for another video. We'll get to that another time. Number four, cesspools. Hey, here's a note. If you're gonna make a massive castle, you need to know where not to build certain rooms. In case you're building a castle, anyone watching? Like, say over a cesspool, as an example. Yeah, don't build anything heavy over here, or else, Let's talk about it. Cesspools were often placed under floors, which makes sense, because, you know, gravity and life and stuff. But you need to make sure those floors are supportive enough, period. That's it. Or else, this will happen. Back in 1183, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire had a dinner in the palace of Erfurt. But in the main floor, the main hall broke open, resulting in a bunch of dinner guests falling through said floor, with even a few drowning again in said cesspool. Yeah, it's a horrible way to go. And then again, in 1326 in England, Richard the Raker had just sat down. The guy hasn't even started his meal yet and then again the floor beneath him broke and he fell through and drowned in a cesspool that's like the worst way to drown too i'd say chamber pots were safer but when it comes to waste out of sight out of mind sadly just get that shit away from me just downhill get it out or else we'll drown in it probably number three roman shampoo okay when my hair grew out over the pandemic i had a panic attack i've never i don't know what the f to do i had a huge wake-up call i've never had long hair before i don't know what to use in this mop i still don't clearly evidently all i had growing up was the classic four-in-one shampoo for guys that wasn't working out at all that sucked i needed some curl cream okay separate Jars of items, not just a five-in-one with mouthwash on your head. That's those aren't those aren't good. Those don't do anyone any good. But the ancient Romans, they didn't have head and shoulders back then. What did they do? Well, sometimes nothing. They would dip their hair in cold water and at public bathhouses, also very public. Then they would rub and scrape away oils. Lime water was also used to wash your hair, but that was just as useful as lime wire. Sometimes Europeans wouldn't even use water at all to clean their head. They would rub their head with bran, like just a loose bran before bed, and then they'd brush it out with a comb in the morning. Yeah, bran. I used dog shampoo once by accident. I thought that was bad. Bran? <laughs> He's so itchy, I wouldn't sleep a wink. Number two, 
Ancient socks. Somebody got me socks over the holidays as a gift, and let me tell you, last year, I became a man. I was like, thank you, I actually love this. This is now the best gift of my life. Socks and lip balm, that's it. I don't want a PlayStation, get lost. Socks in ancient Greece, first of all, they weren't, you know, the ankle socks, they weren't Vans skateboarding socks, they weren't the weird grippy ones that kids have. Where were those growing up, first of all? Not even close. Socks came around in the eighth century BC and it was made fresh from animal hairs. This led to Romans tying animal skins around their feet and then, you know, tying it more and more and more and higher and higher. Anything to keep it there. Now cut to the second century AD in ancient Rome, the sock game finally got real. Romans began using fabrics instead of animal skins. It was now softer, it was lighter, and then later in the fifth century, socks were worn only by the most holy, which is kind of ironic because socks have holes in them. You get the joke, there it is. Socks were associated with the church. They were considered a symbol of purity. Socks would go all the way up your leg back then. Like I said, a little different than the uh, New Balance ankle socks we got today. A little less holy. Finally, number one, public bathhouse. This last one, okay, we haven't moved on from this at all. That's why I wanted to finish this list. Nice little fresh fun reminder from Taylor McWaters. Here we go. We still bathe together a lot. We go to water parks and we swim around in pools filled with pee. Ancient Roman bathhouses were the older, slightly yuckier versions of water parks. They would literally spread intestinal parasites. They were actually way worse. And these massive rooms with giant pools just lie disease, nude, there were and everyone was sweaty and it was all tight and there was no filtration system. It was like an indoor hot tub without the pumps or the salts, it was gross. The Romans were literally figuring out sewage systems at the same time, which I of course mentioned earlier, but they were also the first to create heated public baths. Yeah, my above ground pool wasn't heated, but the ancient Romans, they had heated pools, Great, I gotta send an email to my dad this afternoon. Now I'm pissed. The archeology span and anthropology department at Cambridge discovered that Romans brought lots of parasites to Europe. Yeah, the fossilized feces showed that these heated, relaxing, rejuvenating bathhouses nearby were all but yeah, they were horrible. They were just spreading hot disease, coming in hot. I don't mean to undermine the ancient Romans. To be fair, they also brought with them lice and fleas. Ayo, this one for the road. Number 10, feet picks. There's a lot of people on the internet, and a lot of those people are kind of strange. But perhaps the strangest group on the interwebs are the same people who enjoy the interwebbing of toes. Yep, looking at the people who love feed pics. Hey, I'm not judging. All I'm saying is that I'm gonna keep my Air Force Ones away from you guys. I don't want you guys looking at my Air Force Ones. Don't look at my Air Force Ones like that. Where does such a phenomenon come from? Well, it may be ancient China and its tradition of foot binding. Yes, if you didn't know, it was a custom for women to bind their feet into a very unique shape, said to have been inspired by the emperor's ladies of the evening after a most graceful dance. Women in China wanted to follow suit and started binding their feet. What's crazy is how crazy their feet looked afterwards. A painful process that often had ill side effects. Toenails would often become ingrown and cause infection. Sometimes nails were removed completely to prevent infection. If you gotta remove your toenails to wear shoes, I don't know if that's good for you. Thankfully this has fallen out of practice and is kept away from the people who have a thing for feet. Number nine. You and what army? If there was an invention that would make you rich, it would be something that allows you to bring your favorite possessions into the afterlife. Egyptians wanted to bring gold and kitties. Vikings were buried with swords. I mean, after all, you can't go to heaven without a piece. I get it. And when I pass on, like many folks of my generation, we will take crippling anxiety and depression with us. Or so we'll try. Many have tried to take many different things into the afterlife, but strangely, they all get left behind here. The most obtuse example of this is the Terracotta Army. You might have heard of this one before, but honestly, it's so cool. Emperor Chin woke up one morning and thought, hey, what if I need an army in the afterlife? So, a Terracotta Army was constructed. I didn't think there was this many, but there's actually over 6,000 life-size Terracotta soldiers who originally wielded real swords and blades. Building an army to protect you in the afterlife is a bold move, Emperor. Number eight unified workforce. Today it takes a lot of hard work to be next to the president. A lot of education, a small loan of a million dollars, and yes manning your way up Capitol Hill. It is a tried and true formula. However, politicians and advisors of ancient China had a rather different and messed up price to pay to be on the emperor's side. A lot of the emperor's advisors were eunuchs, which if you didn't know, it's somebody who had their meat in veg removed, if you know what I'm saying. Usually a punishment for a crime, but sometimes self-inflicted to join the ranks of the emperor's court. Yeah, that's right. Dudes were racing to do that to themselves so they could be a part of the emperor's court. 
These guys even held some power, actually, a surprising amount. Part of the thought was if you couldn't give birth to a child or a successor, then you wouldn't feel the Sith-like urge to power grab and overthrow the Emperor. While I'm sure this may have been effective at first, somebody had to be questioning these methods. Between a bag full of criminal sausage and the guy on the chopping block, this is really messed up. Number 7. Yellow Crystals I hope you're not eating breakfast while listening to this part, but here we go. To make a long story short, ancient China is credited with inventing endocrinology. This involves separating hormones from human secretions. That word sounds really gross. How did ancient China accomplish hormone studies without microscopes, lab coats, and a government budget? Ancient Chinese secret. Nah, I'm just kidding, they use pee. You get the whole village together, right? Which includes 150 men, and then they all urinate into a pot. You cook the said yellow mixture of evil, and you boil it down till there's nothing left but crystals. You can't inject things yet, because there's no needles, so the only way to get it in you is eating it. Oh yeah, that's right sports fans, eating yellow rocks for medicinal purposes. Urine was thought to have some sort of medicinal properties, so I, I guess this makes sense? I Come on over, man. Come have some. Money. Wanna wanna try my soup, dude? I got some got some pea soup, bro. Number six, eggs a la pee pee. Continuing with the theme of the warm yellow stuff, we got a cuisine item here that I'm not sure most folks at home would want. I'm sure you guys would pass this up. In the ancient city of Dongyang, a delicacy called something that YouTube won't let me say. The recipe goes as follows: pot of eggs, check, add some urine from people under the age of 18, and boil. Like mentioned before, the golden liquid is supposed to have some sort of medicinal properties. This is usually the part of the script where after my mildly funny joke, I diffuse the chaos by stating that certain practices like these are no longer done. Went away with the old time, we didn't want it anymore. Oh, on the contraire, my cyber surfing friends, weirdly enough, it is still done today. It's said that the taste is like that of springtime. Winter is my favorite season anyway. This is just one of the things you'll just never forget. Number five, Cricket Gladiator. They say that if bread is the first necessity of life, then recreation is a close second. A quote that the ancient Chinese lived by. Blood sport being a common denominator of the day. So were the Chinese warriors dueling it out with martial arts and unique fighting techniques? or cricket fights. Ah, yeah, you guessed it, cricket fights. Cricket fights were a form of gambling and hobby that pitted male crickets against one another. This was the real deal too. These crickets were treated like prize horses today. These bad boys were bred for the sport, extremely violent and ready to destroy. Actually, unlike other harsh and cruel gambling sports, cricket fighting often didn't end up harming the cricket. While being kept in a clay pot, they were fed good diets and even had female crickets dropped in the pot right before a fight. Just so the little guys know what he was fighting for out there. You go get him, Tiger. Go get him. Number four of lice and men. You guys love your hygiene videos, as we've done a lot here on this channel. And you don't need an expert to tell you that as humans, we did some really gross stuff in the past. Well, if this doesn't make you want to refund your lunch, I don't know what does. Folks back in ancient China had a lice problem. You might be thinking to yourself, oh, I had lice as a kid. <laughs> That's no big deal. Well, back then it was. See, people had so many lice that people would just pick them off and eat them. I mean, come on. Are you really going to let all that juicy protein go to waste? Doctors would recommend eating ash to aid people that had stomach aches from consuming too many of the bugs. They also used lice to determine how healthy someone was. If lice were crawling all over the person, they would live. But if the lice were jumping off the person like a rat fleeing a sinking ship, they would not live. You can tell this was a time of great medical knowledge and understanding. With that logic, a corpse with flies around it still has a good chance of making it to work the next morning. Number three, the Black Death. This Silk Road was an economic and political trade agreement made and traveled by empires in Asia and Eastern Europe on multiple trade routes that expanded culture, technology, and learning. But of course, that wasn't the only thing being exchanged. Unfortunately for traders and people just trying to live their lives, the bubonic plague was making its rounds and spreading along the Silk Road. Sadly, the bubonic plague would claim millions of lives across the old world. The grossest part being the acral necrosis. Acral necrosis is the black discoloration of the skin of the extremities due to decreased blood supply to the affected areas. That lovely symptom is probably how it became to be known as the Black Death. Thanks, Silk Road. Number two, scabs are us. The Black Death might have been the biggest and baddest disease of the ancient world, but it wasn't the only one. There were other bad characters in that bunch. Meet Smallpox, 
another very contagious disease that would start with a red rash and develop into small pustules. They then turned into scabs and fell off. Top Chinese doctors at the time thought, hey, what if we give the scabs to people in hopes they build an immunity? Like some sort of pseudo-barbaric vaccine. So they took scabs from sick patients, and after for sure washing their hands, crushed the scabs into a powder and blew it up people's noses with a pipe. It kinda worked, but a lot of people died in the process. Man, what a time to be alive, or maybe dead. With healthcare like that, you're probably just not gonna live too long anyway. Number one, the century of humiliation. The 1800s were not a hot time for China, and yes, I can hear you, I know what you're gonna say. It wasn't exactly ancient times. The 1800s are kinda considered to be modern times, but, but, China had one little problem. China had been pillaged and bullied by foreign powers, which if you couldn't tell is never good for your country, and really, you need to sit down in history class to fully understand everything that was going on up to this point. China just wasn't as modern as the other countries at the time and still had a feudal dynasty in a sense. The point I'm trying to get to is the Taiping Rebellion was messed up. Multiple factors led and caused the rebellion and like I always say, it wouldn't be good history without a little blood. And after the Opium Wars, which was involved with that and a cause and effect, a famine and some other diseases that actually weren't pee related, millions were dead as the century did become to know the century of humiliation. At number 10, spicy defense. Usually when you think about wars from ancient times, you think of swords, spears, bows, and arrows as being the primary weapons used to fight, but that wasn't entirely the case with the ancient Greeks. It turns out that their warfare was a lot more advanced than you'd think. The ancient Greeks were actually known to have used chemical warfare as part of their defense. They were known to use poison-tipped arrows and incendiary weapons. The earliest example of such a thing in ancient Greece comes from the siege of Plataea in 429 BC, when Spartan soldiers set fire to a wood pile with sulfur, releasing sulfur dioxide gas into the air and forcing the opposing force to flee their positions. According to other accounts, they may have also poisoned the water supply. The most famous case of chemical warfare from the Greeks, however, comes from the Byzantine Greeks when they invented a petroleum-based substance that couldn't be extinguished with water and would be fired from tubes that were attached to Greek ships. What's so cool about that is the fact that no one has ever been able to recreate it. At number 9, hashtag roasted. I'm sure you've no doubt heard of the messed up punishment devices that have been used throughout history. I have to say that the people of the past were very creative when it came to coming up with ways to bring harm to others, and the ancient Greeks were no exception. I mean, they certainly weren't the worst when it came to their punishments, but they still were going a little overboard. One of their famously horrific torture devices was called the brazen bull. It was a large hollow casting of a bull made from bronze that had a door installed into the side of it. When someone was up for punishment via the brazen bull, they would be stuffed inside the statue, the door would be closed on them, and a fire would be lit under the bull, heating the metal statue. The person inside would then be sadly roasted alive. I would much rather be roasted on Twitter than inside this mighty metal bull, that's for sure. Before we carry on talking about the messed up things that went on in ancient Greece, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, questionable relationships. The ancient Greeks had some pretty questionable habits when it came to the coming of age of young Greeks. The idea of a relationship between an older person and one who has not yet come of age was not only normal, but was encouraged. As part of the coming of age of young Greek boys, they would be part of a ritualistic kidnapping. Now don't worry, they weren't actually being taken from their beds in the middle of the night. This was more so an agreement made by the boy's father ahead of time, but either way, they would still be taken by an older person from the community, where they would be taken out into the wilderness and taught how to hunt, they would feast, and they would learn how to be an adult. They would later return to the community where they would be given the choice of either severing ties with their adult partner or continuing their relationship with them. It's certainly a little unsettling the fact that this kind of thing was normal. At number 7, backwards logic. It was tough being a woman in ancient Greece. I mean, it's been tough being a woman at any time throughout history and we're still fighting for our place in society on many fronts, but back in the times of ancient Greece, they had it really bad. Part of Greek society included the notion that women were objects and as a result, the 
Greeks saw adultery as a worse crime than non-consensual relations. Now you're probably scratching your head thinking, why? And my dear viewer, I will tell you why they had this sort of backwards logic. You see, since women were considered to be objects and property, any kind of misconduct or mistreatment to a woman, especially one's spouse, this was considered to be almost like theft of this object, and so if found guilty, the person responsible for this injustice would be tried for adultery, not the real crime at hand, being the mistreatment of a woman. The punishment for an adulterer was quite severe, as when caught, they could risk being killed on the spot, and in the event of whatever affair, that would be grounds for an immediate divorce. At number 6, deformed males. Further on the topic of the presence of women in ancient Greek society, let's talk about how women were seen in their communities. Now, even though Aristotle was considered to be one of the greatest philosophers in history, his ideas were also quite flawed. During his life, he believed that women were deformed males who were created when, quote, something went wrong in their mother's wombs. End quote. They considered women to be so terrible that the philosopher Plato also warned men against being reincarnated as a woman in the next life, saying that this could be avoided if they had lots of success during their current lifetime. Because of this view on women, baby girls were often abandoned, girls' education focused primarily on how to have and raise a family, and when girls were married off, they were considered to be property like I mentioned in the previous number. At number 5, democracy? Though the Greeks are often credited with the creation of democracy, much like anything else in this world, it has a dark history, one of injustice and bloodshed. Back in the days of ancient Greece and in the relatively early days of democracy, this political practice could sometimes be used for nefarious purposes. One of the best examples of that comes from the Mytilian debate of 427 BC. Basically what happened here is that during the Peloponnesian War, the city-state of Mytilene tried to free itself from the influence of Athens. Their revolt ultimately failed and the citizens of the city-state were subjected to a severe punishment. They decided to not only execute the prisoners that they'd taken to Athens, but also the entire adult male population and women and children were sold into slavery. The vote to put a stop to Mytilene weighed heavily on the minds of those who voted for this outcome, so they later staged another vote, ultimately choosing to only punish those who were directly involved in the city's revolt. At number 4, Crime and Punishment Earlier I mentioned one of the gruesome ways that people were punished in ancient Greece, but let me tell you some more about their ways of crime and punishment. The standard form of executing prisoners was by performing what was called a bloodless crucifixion. Basically, the convicted individual would, quote, be fastened to a board by the wrists and ankles and a collar around the neck would be tightened gradually to strangle them to death. End quote. If an execution had to take place on a battlefield, the accused would be beheaded, but if given the option, you could sometimes avoid a violent death by instead choosing to ingest poison on your own terms. If you committed a crime and were able to avoid execution, then you would be exiled. If your crime was bad enough to be banished from your community, then your name and crime would be inscribed somewhere so that no one forgot what you did, meaning that your crime would be known for the rest of time. At number three, this is Sparta. As you could imagine, childhood during ancient times was certainly no easy cakewalk, but one of the worst upbringings in ancient Greece had to go to the young citizens of Sparta. Just to give you an idea of how life might have been as a Spartan, just think about the fact that it was literally written into law that Spartans had to be quote, fearless, ruthless, and disciplined above all else. End quote. Back then, a young Spartan boy would only grow up with his parents until he was 7 years old, which at this point he would then be sent to a military camp run by the state where he would stay until he turned 30. Young Spartans were taught mostly about fighting, perfecting the art of combat, and would spend very little time learning math and music. These kids were taught to be ruthless, stealing for their survival, and not showing any fear towards their enemies. At number 2, Ostracism. In Athens, back during ancient Greece, ostracism was a common aspect of political life. Back then, the citizens would evaluate the performance of their politicians. They would then vote on who didn't serve them well or who they didn't like, and the citizens would write the name of said person on a piece of broken pottery. The person who gained the most votes from the public would then be exiled from Athens for 10 years. Unfortunately, this was kind of a flawed system, and any clever politician would then be able to use this ostracism vote in order to get rid of their rival. After Athenian figured out the flaw in their system, their ostracism votes were later ended. And finally, at number one, sacrifice. At this point, after learning about so many ancient civilizations, I think it's safe to assume that basically every civilization had their sacrifices. 
human sacrifices, I mean. It's been theorized that perhaps the ancient Greeks were participating in such practices because back in 2016, the remains of a teenager were found on Mount Lycaon, which appeared to have been, quote, a product of ritual sacrifice, end quote. It is thought that perhaps this person was meant to serve as a sacrifice to the god Zeus. On top of that, there has also been pieces of ancient literature that depicts the sacrificing individuals in the same area that those remains were found. We don't know for certain if this kind of ritual was part of everyday life or if it was just a one-off type deal. At number 10, Treaties of the Vessels. I think that most of us love the idea of uncovering some kind of lost treasure. I, for one, would love to pull an Indiana Jones and uncover artifacts lost to the sands of time, but realistically, you need a lot of clues in order to find these things. They could be anywhere. The world is quite a large place, you know. That's why ancient texts and documents are so important to researchers, because sometimes they can give clues as to where some treasures might be. This is sort of the case with the Treaties of the Vessels. This ancient Hebrew text claims to reveal the location of where the treasures of King Solomon's temple are hidden. Well, sort of. The text discusses the location of the treasures as well as the fate of the Ark of the Covenant, which is a chest that is said to hold tablets engraved with the Ten Commandments. And as you would imagine, these are highly sought after, but no one knows where it is, and the Treaties of the Vessels isn't really much help to researchers. The text says that the location of these things will quote, not be revealed until the day of the coming of the Messiah, son of David. So it just teases us with this mystery. We still have to wait to find these treasures. At number nine, Gospel of the Lots of Mary. Have you ever wished that you could know the future? Maybe you want to know how a relationship would play out, or if you should do something about your career, but you just need that little confirmation of future events to help you along. Well, if you lived in ancient times, then you might have sought out the Gospel of the Lots of Mary to help you with your needs. This ancient text is quite the gospel and dates back to around 1500 years. The Gospel of the Lots of Mary doesn't discuss the life of Jesus Christ, but instead contains 37 oracles that were written pretty vaguely. The original text was written in Coptic, an Egyptian language, and has been translated in modern times. The book opens with the words, quote, The Gospel of the Lot of Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, she to whom Gabriel the archangel brought the good news, he who will go forward with his whole heart will obtain what he seeks, only do not be of two minds. End quote. Researchers believe that this book would have been used for divination in an attempt to seek knowledge of the future. Someone in need of answers would seek out this book, ask a question, and then would have gone through a process that would randomly select one of the 37 oracles to give answers to said person's problem. Almost like how we read horoscopes, but much more mysterious. Before we carry on talking about these strange and mysterious texts, why not leave a big ol' thumbs up on this video if you are thoroughly entertained so far? And while you're at it, why not subscribe to the channel to see more videos like this one and join the hive. At number 8, Liber Lintius. This next ancient text almost counts as a hidden message because of where this text was found by researchers. The Liber Lintius is an ancient text written in Estrusian, a language that was used in Italy in ancient times. What makes this text so mysterious is the fact that it was found preserved in the wrappings of an Egyptian mummy that dates back around 2200 years. This ancient text meaning isn't exactly clear, partially because the Etruscan language isn't fully understood, but researchers believe that the written text on the mummy's wrappings are of a ritual calendar. More research is needed to fully decipher this mysterious text, but it's a really cool find nonetheless. At number 7, Gospel of Judas. Guys, we might have quite the plot twist on our hands, and it's all thanks to this mysterious ancient text. Researchers found a 3rd century text that they called the Gospel of Judas, and after being translated, might have revealed an alternate version of an event from the Bible. Originally written in Coptic, the Gospel of Judas seems to be a depiction of Judas Iscariot it, the man who betrayed Jesus in the New Testament in a positive light. In the New Testament, Judas was said to have betrayed Jesus by revealing his identity to those who had come to arrest him in exchange for 30 pieces of silver, but in the Gospel of Judas, it describes Jesus as asking Judas to betray him in order for him to be crucified so that he could ascend to heaven. This plot twist is debated among some people though, as other researchers have 
said that the text actually declares Judas as a demon. Either way, it's a new spin on the story that we didn't have before, and I'd say that's pretty darn mysterious. At number six, Grolier Codex. Imagine owning something that you believe was just a piece of art turned out to actually be an ancient artifact. This kind of thing is actually a lot more common than you'd think, since over the years, pillaging and looting of ancient sites have led to many artifacts being misplaced and sold around the world. This is the case with the Grolier Codex. The Grolier Codex is an ancient Mayan codex that contains Maya hieroglyphs, illustrations of gods, and a calendar that tracks the movement of Venus. Want to know where they found it? In a club in New York. The person who acquired the codex, a Mexican collector named Jose Sanez, said that he got it from a group of looters in the 1960s, and after a lot of debate, it was found that the codex that he had was in fact authentic. Researchers found that this ancient text was written on paper that dates back about 800 years and was written using paint known as Maya Blue, which actually wasn't synthesized in a lab until pretty recently. I think it's pretty crazy that this ancient text from the Maya civilization somehow ended up in New York and no one really noticed. At number 5, Popol Vuh. Just about every civilization has their interpretation of Earth's origins. Some cultures believe that cosmic beings made the Earth, others believed in various gods and various motivations for creating life. One ancient text that was discovered by researchers tells the story of the Maya and their belief of how the world was created. This ancient text known as Popol Vuh, which ultimately is translated to Book of Counsel, is a mythical origin story. According to the tales written in this ancient text, the forefather gods, quote, brought forth the earth from a watery void and endowed it with animals and plants, end quote. The text also describes how the gods had difficulties making humans and tells the story of how they created two humans hero twins who went on a series of adventures and even defeated the Lord of the Underworld. The earliest surviving copy of Popol Vuh dates back to 1701, but it is believed that there were earlier copies of the text that might not have been found or have been lost. At number 4, Copper Scroll. Next up, let's talk about another ancient text that discusses the existence of a large treasure. An ancient Hebrew text called the Copper Scroll was found in a cave in the Judean desert. This ancient text is believed to contain recorded details of a vast treasure that may include gold, silver, vessels, and coins. The Copper Scroll dates back to sometime around 70 CE, which coincides with a time when the Roman army laid siege to Jerusalem and the Second Temple, a Jewish holy temple which stood on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, was destroyed. Researchers are still unsure if these treasures described in the Copper Scroll actually exist, as it is still highly debated. Even if these treasures really did exist, it could have already been found back in ancient times, but even still, no treasure as large as the one described in the scroll have been found in Israel or Palestine. At number 3, Dresden Codex. For researchers, being able to find ancient texts is very exciting because it can teach them a lot about a civilization, its people, and their beliefs. However, they're often pretty hard to come by due to a number of reasons like poor preservation, warfare, looting, and more. In the case of the Mayans, many of their artifacts and written documents were believed to have been destroyed by Christian missionaries trying to wipe out any non-Christian beliefs, so when one of their ancient texts is found, it's a pretty big deal. When the Dresden Codex was found, it was a huge accomplishment for researchers. The Dresden Codex Codex is an ancient Mayan document that dates back 800 years and contains 39 sheets of text with beautifully drawn images and text on both sides. Researchers done on this codex indicate that it is a record of the phases of the planet Venus so that the Maya, quote, would be certain that their ceremonial events were being held on the correct day. End quote. The codex first appeared in Germany in 1730, but no one really knows how it got there. At number two, Voynich Manuscript. Now this next ancient text is pretty mysterious simply because no one can read it. Dun dun dun. That's right, the Voynich Manuscript, a 250-page book containing illustrations of plants, cosmological symbols, and naked ladies, is carbon dated to have originated sometime in the 15th century. It also contains unreadable text. This book was first discovered in 1912 by an antique book dealer, and since then, the text in the book has yet to have been deciphered. There is speculation amongst researchers that suggests that perhaps the language in this book is a lost language, or code, or perhaps just gibberish. However, a recent study of the book's language suggests that it does have the hallmarks of a real language. You know what I think the Voynich manuscript is? An alien document. Think about it. Aliens came to Earth and they documented what they saw, like native plant species and humans, hence the drawings of women, because come on, how can you not be obsessed with women? 
right? And these cosmological symbols found in the book would also be tied to the aliens because of course they're from outer space. But what do you guys think? And finally, at number one, Handbook of Ritual Power. Saving the best and most mysterious ancient text for last, we have the Handbook of Ritual Power. This is a 20 page ancient codex that dates back around 1300 years and is written in Coptic. What's so interesting and mysterious about this little book is its contents. Within the 20 pages of this ancient book are magic spells and formulas, including love spells, spells for curing black jaundice, and even instructions on how to perform an exorcism. It's believed that this ancient text may have been written by a group of Sethians, an ancient Christian sect who praised Seth, the third son of Adam and Eve. What adds to the already mysterious contents of the book is the book's opening, as it references a mysterious unknown figure named Bactiotha. A translation of the opening text of the handbook reads, quote, I give thanks to you and I call upon you the Bactiotha, the great one who is very trustworthy, the one who is lord over the forty and the nine kinds of serpents. End quote. The book is now housed in a museum in Sydney after they purchased it from an antiquities dealer in Vienna. How this dealer acquired the book though remains unknown. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Zanzwingdui Ruins. These ruins located in China's southwest province may just provide archaeologists clues on their past. Very recently, this past year as a matter of fact, new artifacts were found, a total of 534 relics. These cultural staples made of bronze, gold, ivory, a couple of these relics have been turning heads and raising eyebrows. This 3,000 year old bronze figure, for example, seems to be holding an ancient wine vessel. And this relic stands a little over one meter. These ruins were luckily discovered during a a refurbishment of a primary school, the Sichuan Provincial Cultural Relics and Archaeology Research Institute found over 80 tombs, 60 ash pits, and 10 building zones, all of them dating back to the Western Zhou Dynasty, so back around 770 BC. Researchers have been examining the site for a couple years now, and although the people of Shu left little to no detail on their culture, we're finding all these artifacts that tell us a story. Like for example, the one pound gold mask found in one of the six sacrificial pits. So we're getting there one beautiful relic at a time. Number nine, seahorses. Ancient Chinese medicine was kind of incredible. Honestly, they had like a kind of sixth sense when it came to how certain things might work. Some of them were pretty questionable, I will say, I'm, I will not lie, but they had something right about seahorses. Even today, you can find seahorses at markets as a street snack, but beyond a tasty treat, they have been used as a part of Chinese medicine since time immemorial. It was believed that they had the potential to cure infertility, baldness, asthma, and arthritis. Research work on seahorses provided information that has the ability to help ease inflammatory symptoms associated with arthritis. A peptide derived from the seahorse species, Hippocampus cuda, proved to be effective towards chromocyte cells. So they were kind of right. It did do something. Number eight, magic mirrors. Because of horror movies, it's hard for me to open and close a bathroom mirror. I can't do it. They always do it so slow in the movies as well. I'm like, oh, just slam it. But in ancient China, mirrors were considered a good omen, actually. So much so that after a loved one passed, a mirror was often hung on the ceiling of the burial chambers, you know, to prevent evil spirits from ruining your beauty sleep. If you encountered an evil spirit, the first place you would have to go is near one of these ancient mirrors. So when archeologists found these 2000 year old ancient artifacts, one of these mirrors was still able to reflect images. The world's strongest Windex, there we go. We found more than 80 of these, so it's quite important back in the day. Inscriptions were also left on these mirrors as well, like family wealth, eternal joy, anything to preserve their memory. I would much rather have a giant mirror than a tombstone after I pass away, but it's gotta be a funhouse mirror because any other mirror is uh, scary. And also, I can't get my hands on these ones. They're a little bit, they're slim pickings. There's only 80 of these. Number seven, John Wen. This kind of gives off Anastasia vibes a little. A prince thought to be alive after he was destroyed in a fire. Mm. In 1402, the Ming capital of Nanjing, a fire was smoldering beneath political strife. The capital was invaded by the emperor's own uncle, Zhu Di. He later accused his own nephew of being corrupted and lying to the people. Finally, the storm that had been brewing for years erupted. A rebellion was launched by his uncle with the aim of getting rid of the emperor's ministers and for Di to take power. He destroyed the palace by fire while the emperor was still inside. Three bodies were recovered from the wreckage, assumed to be the bodies of Jian Wen, his Empress and their eldest son. His uncle soon declared himself emperor, but the people believed that John Wen had escaped. Rumors that he smuggled out just in time and was living as a monk somewhere else in China circulated. His uncle tried to erase any trace of his legacy, but the people remembered, just kind of like Anastasia. 
Yeah. Number six, ancient seismograph. Zhang Heng, a Chinese astronomer and a mathematician born in 78 AD, created the world's first seismoscope in 132 AD. And it's absolutely weirdly gorgeous. I mean, look at this thing. So what would happen was, Heng figured this out, that when an earthquake hit, this pendulum inside the urn would move, as do most things during an earthquake. And in turn, when it picked up vibrations, it dropped a ball out of the mouth of the ancient metal dragon. The ball then falls into one of the mouths of a metal frog, making a beautiful but concerning clang sound. Now apparently the first time this happened, nobody even felt a thing, but days later, when a messenger finally arrived, it was then told that an earthquake did in fact happen. This type of ancient knowledge blows my mind. Like this guy changed the world. Not too mysterious per se, but rather impressive how he was able to figure this out. Number five, feet binding. Beauty is pain, am I right? <laughs> Oh no. We humans spend a lot of time trying to be attractive for one another, and in ancient China, tiny feet. They were awesome. The tinier the feet, the more attractive they were. With bound feet, a woman's beauty was enhanced. Some were even bound to be 10 centimeters in size. So small. It was also a status symbol because the rich didn't need to work. Because as you can guess, having deformed feet prevented women from being able to leave the house. So if you were poor, you didn't bind your feet. It was a painful process. They would soak the feet in warm water mixed with herbs and animal blood. Then they would curl the toes over the sole of the foot and wrap it in cloth, breaking the toe was in the arches so that it could be as small as possible. Oof. It wasn't until 1912 that it was actually banned. Number four, the number four, literally. Some numbers are quite lucky when it comes to Chinese culture. The number eight, for example, if you had an apartment on the eighth floor, it would sell for a higher price than that of the seventh. And no, it's not because seven, eight, nine, but rather because the number eight is pronounced ba, which sounds familiar to fa, as in fakai, which translates to becoming rich or well off. The 2008 Beijing Olympics kicked off on August 8th at 8.08 p.m., eight seconds in. It's a big deal still to this day, but the number four, on the other hand, over here is even more unlucky than the number 13. It's bad juju, the number four. It actually causes traffic to this day in Beijing. Let me explain. The number four sounds a lot like the word death, so buildings don't have this number as a floor even. It goes two, three, five. Although if you're on floor five, you know what's up. The traffic problem though, that's when it gets intense. See, Beijing has a vehicle plate program set in order to maintain the flow of traffic and also to help out with pollution. Depending on which numbers end in your plate, so on weekdays, private cars with plates ending in two digits, zero to nine, are not allowed to drive in Beijing's fifth ring road all day. So if your number is on a certain day, you need to find another route to work. Makes sense. So the lucky numbers are used more often, which means more traffic on those days, but if you had a plate ending in four, that's just 2% of all cars. You're flying to work. You're laughing on the way to work. It's easy, you're there in two minutes. Number three, terracotta warriors. Shin Shi Huang, who lived around 259 to 210 BCE, was not only an infamous conqueror in life, but he desired to be the same in death. He wanted to be immortalized, so he decided to build himself an immaculate tomb. It was basically an underground city guarded by the famous life-sized terracotta warriors. But not only that, it was complete with gardens, stables, horses, bronze, ritual vessels, jewelry, and he heaps of treasure. This immaculate piece of art represented many of the ways in which the first emperor left an impression on his civilization. During his reign, he introduced standardized currency, writing, mathematical measurements, and plenty more. He was a military genius, though his methods were basically massacres. He was credited for unifying states together. But his underground city of immortality remains one of his most mysterious footprints he left, making sure the world never forgot him even thousands of years later. Number two, you're in trouble. We've done lists now on numerous ancient cultures and the way that they use their natural gift of water, you know, varies. Romans would use their urine to wash their clothes. Ancient Egyptians would pee on barley to predict a newborn sex. In ancient China, over 150 gallons of urine was often collected in this giant pan and then it was boiled until it evaporated. The result was something called autumn mineral, this crystallized urine residue that's later given to patients to consume. Yummy. Urine eggs were also a thing. That's when you boil an egg for an entire day in the not so mellow yellow. When it came down to smelling good in ancient China, the wealthy would wear scented bags, but if you weren't well off, you had to wash up with urine, just as the Romans did. And last but not least, the lake of wine. A lake of wine? Sign me up! I'm in. I'm diving in. I prefer the grape variety just like King Zhou. It's tough to be a king, but he was resolved to make sure he had a damn good time. He must have loved the OG charcuterie boards because this dude ordered the construction of a pool of wine and a forest of meat. 
What? A pool of wine, I can imagine. A forest of meat? No idea. The pool was massive, big enough to fit several canoes. In the middle of the pool was a little island with a tree made out of skewers of meat. Creative. Uh, Zhao and his concubines would pass the time floating around the pool of wine, plucking off meat and living their best life. Sounds awesome. Honestly, I'd be in. However, his decadence didn't really please his people. Um, kind of like a Marie Antoinette deal, and they began uprising. And as soon as he realized this was happening, instead of you know addressing it, he, he set himself on fire. So I think his time can be summarized by Trooper. We're here for a good time, not for a long time. Kicking off the list at number 10, eye patches. Okay, perhaps one of the most notable features of a pirate has to be the old eye patch. If you're a pirate for Halloween and you don't have the eye patch, well, you just look like a hipster. Like, what are you? We don't know. It matters. It's a noticeable detail. But why did so many pirates cover their eyes? Was it because they got poked by Blackbeard? No. You know when you get up in the middle of the night to go to the washroom, and then as soon as you turn the light on, you're blinded for a hot minute, you can't even see, your ears are ringing, you don't even know where you are? It takes your eyes 20 minutes to adjust to darkness, so pirates having to go from the deck to under the ship back and forth, they had to keep one eye in the dark. Or else they'd be covering their eyes for most of their shift, which you really can't have when you're running a tight ship. Nobody has the time for that, so cover your eyes and be blind half the time. At number nine, earrings. When you think about what a stereotypical pirate looked like, you probably think of tattered clothing, hats, maybe an eye patch, and earrings. While their style, though pretty odd, also had a purpose, specifically the earring. Pirates were very superstitious, and their earrings followed in their superstitions as well. There were a lot of different beliefs that pirates had about these earrings. Some pirates believed that it could somehow improve or even cure bad eyesight. Why? No clue. Maybe they thought that ears and eyes were connected or something. I mean, they do start with the same letter. Some pirates also believed that the precious metals that their earrings were made of possessed magical healing powers, so maybe that's why they believed that they would heal their eyes. They also thought that having pierced ears would help them with seasickness, and that having a gold earring would serve as some kind of protective talisman, and that if you wore one, you would be protected from drowning. Number eight, hooks. Growing up watching cartoons, I've seen many versions of Captain Hook, or pirates that resemble a Captain Hook type of villain. They all have the eye patch, earrings, and to make them more menacing, they have hooks for hands. Dustin Hoffman scared the shit out of me growing up in the movie Hook. It's literally called Hook, what's up with this? Well, this wasn't a move by film studios, this was actually historically accurate. Back in those days, they didn't have advanced prosthetic limbs, and when you're sword fighting over loot, well, odds are you're gonna lose a hand or two at one point. These pirates actually got compensation, which is so funny to me, just imagining a pirate filling out an insurance form, that's funny, but their replacement tool was usually a hook, or a peg leg. They would just replace your leg with a singular piece of wood. That was the best they could do back then, and it had to work. Another fun little fact, if you got injured, your payroll came out of everybody's collective treasure. So you better have that athletic stance down and dodge some swords or else you're getting some shame. A lot of shame coming your way. At number seven, walk the plank. I'm sure you have no doubt heard of the term walking the plank, right? It is the stereotypical pirate thing to do when you need to get rid of someone, if you know what I mean. Well, we've sort of been misled by this whole walking the plank thing because rather than it be a method of offing your buddy Joe for not following orders, it was actually used as a method of psychological torture. Now, don't get me wrong, pirates had many other imaginative and gruesome ways of unaliving people, but walking the plank really wasn't one of them. It was actually a relatively relatively rare practice as pirates like to do their unaliving practices pretty swiftly. Rather than making their unlucky victim walk a plank into the ocean, the most common form of putting someone six feet under, so to speak, was through keel hauling. Keel hauling was where you tied someone to a rope, threw them into the water, and pulled them under the boat and up to the other side. Now you would think that this person could just hold their breath and then survive, but no, not really. Instead, the unlucky soul would be hitting up against the boat and getting shredded by the barnacles on the boat before coming up to the surface. I don't know about you, but after knowing that, I would much rather walk the plank. Number six, maps, books, and gold. 
Just as valuable as gold and silver, back in the day, maps were a treasure in itself. It kind of helps knowing where you're going, to be fair. Also, pirates need to remember where they left their treasure. You can't really rely on a drunken pirate's memory now, can you? These charts would be stolen, obviously, and in turn, these guys would go on a little national treasure Hans Zimmer pirate adventure. One map in particular from the 1680s, the Spanish Atlas, was stolen, and National Geographic called this stolen map extremely valuable pirate booty. So there's treasure still out there somewhere and somebody's got the directions. Knowledge was key. They didn't have Siri hanging out all day to answer navigational questions. They even had to steal books. Pirates stealing books, what a scene. Some of these pirate heists wouldn't even involve treasure. They would sword fight and just hope that the books on board were worth the battle. Imagine losing countless crew members and all you got is the captain's daily logs. Just sailing the high seas, roasting William Kidd's girl problems. You're like, what an idiot. At number five, marooning. Let's talk about the brutal yet mysterious practice of marooning. And no, we're not talking about Maroon 5. Marooning was a pirate punishment, probably the most dreaded punishment of them all, where someone who committed a serious offense would be taken to a deserted island and then left there. No food, no water, just you and the island. For many, this was a slow and painful death. Being left on an island in the hot sun meant you got badly sunburnt, you had no food unless you could find something in the area, and chances were that there was no fresh water on that island, so you would become dehydrated quite quickly. At high tide, the water could flood the island, or you would be left standing in water up to your neck, and any predators in the area would have seen you as a little snack. This sounds like a terrible way to go. I could not imagine the physical and psychological torment that would come with such a fate. Man, I'm glad I'm not a pirate. Number four, pirate curfew. This next one made me laugh out loud while I was reading up on it. It doesn't matter how badass or cool you think you are, even if you're a literal pirate, you still have a bedtime. These guys would straight up abandon their mateys, they would leave them on an island to die, and then sword fight over treasure. But come eight o'clock, it's time to shut her down. Because it's pirate code, you can't break the code. Captain Black Bart Bartholomew Roberts, he insisted back in 1722 that lights and candles were out at eight o'clock sharp. If anybody wanted to stay up later than eight, they can go and hang out on the deck. Honestly, I love this rule, I'm here for this. Imagine roommates being on board for this as well. Nowadays, you get the best sleep of your life. Thing is, these guys needed all the time they could get because they had to sleep in hammocks. Not the most comfortable or relaxing environment. A hammock nap, sure, but a hammock sleep every night? No wonder pirates were so angry. It's starting to make sense. At number three, cryptic treasure. There once lived a pirate named Olivier Levasseur, and he was considered one of the last great pirates. Over the years, it was said that Levasseur had stolen many treasures of great value and had a large haul of precious finds. Once people finally caught up to him, he was captured and sentenced to death by hanging, but before he died, his final words were, quote, find my treasure, the one who may understand it, end quote. And then he threw a cryptogram into the crowd, and that was the last of them. To this day, no one has been able to decipher the code. Some believe that perhaps this cryptic message was simply designed to lead people on a wild goose chase as a final joke. However, in the 20th century, a man named Reginald Herbert Cruz Wilkins, say that five times fast, made a breakthrough. He had been searching for the treasure for years and finally found the cave that he believed the treasure was located. Unfortunately, the cave's conditions made it impossible to get through, so the treasure remains a mystery to this day. Can you believe this all started because a pirate wanted to pull a Da Vinci code on us? Unbelievable. Number two, Julius Caesar. Pirates would often take people and demand treasure. They would use hostage situations as a main ploy. In fact, at one point in history, pirates managed to scoop up Julius Caesar like the Julius Caesar. The emperor of Rome went through his fair share of trials and at just age 25, he was held captive for 38 days with pirates. That's a very long time to hear horrible sea chanties. When pirates demanded ransom for the release of the young man, they set his price for 20 talents. But according to historians, that price was deemed too low from Caesar himself. He actually laughed at it and reminded these pirates that they had no idea who it was they captured. He said to ask for 50 instead of 20. How insane is that? And finally, at Number one, pirate tunnels. You know the secret tunnel from Avatar The Last Airbender? Well, this secret pirate tunnel is kind of similar. 
Below the city of Savannah, Georgia lies a series of underground tunnels that are believed to have been used by pirates. The pirates would use these tunnel systems to smuggle goods in and out of the area, as well as to smuggle captured sailors. It is said that these tunnels would lead directly to the location where the ships would have been waiting in the harbor. Apparently, there is a tunnel that led from a building in town known as the Pirate's House all the way to the river where small rowing boats would have been waiting. It has also been theorized that the Sons of Liberty, a group of people who strongly opposed the British government, would also use these pirate tunnels to meet up and have a little shindig. There are so many mysteries that surround these pirate tunnels and many of them remain unsolved. Kicking off the list at number 10, Hermes. This quick little lad sure is laid on his feet, but he's also got a few tricks up his little sleeve. He's not an innocent guy. He's known as the messenger because, you know, he's that fast and all. He's fast as boy. Hermes is the son of Zeus and Maya. And as far as parents go, yeah, that's not bad. That's, that's pretty good. Pretty good, uh, pretty good cards dealt in that scenario. He was destined for greatness with his speed and agility. Poems and plays remember the mythical man as quick physically, but he was also quick with his decisions. He could change his mind in the blink of an eye. You can't keep up with him, really, in any sense. His agility allowed him to glide effortlessly between three realms, the three main worlds in mythological ancient Greece, those being heaven, the underworld, and the third, which is often forgotten, the sea. He was a messenger of the gods, but he was also a hashtag prankster. Yeah, classic. When he was just an infant god, he hopped out of his crib and stole cattle. Scandalous gods in history? Yeah, Hermes stole somebody's cattle. TMZ would eat the speedster alive if it was today. Number nine, Odin. In every story and every myth, book, movie, there has to be a big bad guy. And for Norse gods and mythology, that's Odin. It's Big Daddy, and he's here to cause some scandal. He was the king of the gods and a father to many more. We could probably make a whole list on him, but Taylor and I do have to go home at some point. Looking at his track record, it can leave you with mixed feelings. Not Taylor, I meant I meant Odin. Taylor's a good guy. Don't he's he's never he's not never been a criminal. Sorry, Taylor. He created this and that, he gave life to many, but he also took it away unalive imprisoned and tormented and, and a whole list of things that would have the YouTube gods upset. And let me tell you guys, those are some of the gods you really don't want to upset. You don't want them on your bad side. Number eight, Aphrodite. The Greek goddess of love and beauty. Oh boy, cover your eyes for this one, Big Chad. You don't want to see any of this. Yeah, this is, this is dirty, this is dirty stuff. Hit that thumbs up for Aphrodite. The dirty one. Aphros translates to foam, and Hesiod's Theogony tells us that Aphrodite was born from the white foams of heaven. Nice. I was born in Ajax. At first, Aphrodite was worshipped as a goddess of the sea, but in Sparta, she was seen as the goddess of war. Yeah, the goddess had around 17 children with seven different men. And by men, I mean Olympian gods. Yeah, yeah I'm just grabbing coffee with my ex, you know, Poseidon. Relax, Trevor, it's fine. We're just friends. Aphrodite was one of the three contestants in winning the Golden Apple. The Golden Apple was given to the most beautiful goddess at the time, and it was between her, Hera, and Athena. It was a tough one. Aphrodite promised the then Prince of Troy, Paris, that if she was chosen, she would give him Helen, the most beautiful woman in all of Greece. Yes, here's your new wife. How does that sound? Great. And then the Trojan War happened, so scandalous? Yeah, sorry. Can I stop covering my eyes now, Taylor? I don't. I want to see now. She's gone now. She's gone? Okay, she's gone now. Whoa, that's better. Oh, don't want to see anything, you know, too inappropriate or anything. Number seven, Prometheus. Oh, wise and mighty Prometheus, what knowledge do you bring us humble people today? Fire. Fire good. The god that gave us fire. Let's be real about this. We, we needed fire. It's a big one. The same way I need McDonald's in my life. I love the clown's hamburgers. Love you. Trouble is, for Prometheus, he was told by Zeus that we couldn't have fire. He was gatekeeping it. Toxic, right? I know. So Prometheus disobeyed him and gave it to us anyway. Imagine all the Slovaki the Greeks made after that. Oh, yummy. Zeus being Zeus was pretty cheesed about the whole thing. So he sentenced poor Prometheus to an eternity of suffering. A large eagle would come by every day and just take a chunk out of him the same way liposuction makes celebrities look 20 again. It's one thing to disobey dad, but to disobey the king of kings? Buddy, you're gonna be grounded. Number six, Ares. So now that we know who Aphrodite is a little bit, this next one has some juice to it. Time to really spill this tea, this cosmic tea. When Aphrodite married Hephaestus, the god of fire, it sounds like a spicy romance at first, but it was really just an arranged one. 
you know, not much love to it, the classic. Well, truth be told, she really had her eyes the whole time on the God of War, Ares. I mean, to be fair, hard not to. He's the god of war, AKA the spirit of battle. She was a big fan of warfare, you know? She wanted a bad boy, so Aphrodite was like, hey, we should have an affair with our counterparts over here. And Aphrodite is and Ares hooked up and Hephaestus' bed. How rude is that? I mean, to be fair though, He's a god of fire. That's probably a nice bed. Definitely beats a water bed, that's for sure. Yeah, sh should we go to Poseidon's fishy bunk bed or this one? Number five, Baron Samdi. Okay, this one is a throwback to my gamer audience. Remember in, in GoldenEye, Nintendo 64, after beating the game, you got to unlock those two bonus levels? Remember the Egyptian level? And the dude that won't die no matter how much you sling his way? Don't forget the evil cackle too. He's, he's always laughing, that guy, isn't he? Well, who is that? And always creep me out. Well, besides being a cool Bond villain, it's actually a Haitian god or voodoo spirit, Baron Samedi. He's a spirit of mischief, death, up to no goodness, and has a fondness for rum and tobacco. That's kind of cool. He ain't all bad though. It's said that he can cure any disease or ailment of any mortal should he want to. Kind of like, kind of like the anti-hero of the gods. Pretty cool. I just refuse to replay the level from Golden Knight. I'm scared, unless a big tall comedian who works on a History Channel wants to hold my hand while I play. Number four, Eros, the son of chaos. I'd say that's a little scandalous. No. In Greek mythology, Eros was the god of love and love and or. This guy has got it all. You may have heard about his Roman counterpart. She comes around every February with a bow and arrow and doinks you right in your butt. Makes us fall in love with our, you know, friends, coworkers, I don't know. That's right, Cupid and Eros. They were a nice couple. Don't mind the plastic couch coverings. Come on in, take your shoes off, stay a while. We're a weird household. In early historical references, Eros is a primordial god, but more recently he's considered one of Ares and Aphrodite's children, part of the winged love gods. Yeah, the winged love gods, what a crew that is. Imagine them showing up on America's Best Dance Crew. The Jabwalkies would be so screwed. Just float in. Around 700 BC, ancient Greek source, Hesiod's Theogony, I mentioned that earlier, he also mentioned Eros as the fourth god ever to exist. First there is Chaos, and then the Earth, Gaia, and Tartarus, the Abyss, and then our boy, Eros. In 400 BC, however, Permenides, another philosopher, says Eros was the first god. Either way, I'm excited to see Harry Styles play Marvel's version of Eros. When it comes to love and f I'd say they nailed the casting. I don't know, just saying. What, what's up? Number three. Shinigami. If you thought I was gonna talk about Japanese Shimigamis and evil gods from the hit anime series, then you clearly don't know Chetty. I'll give you the facts first. Basically, they are evil gods, spirits from those who have passed on, except they're just down bad, dude. Their intentions are completely dishonorable. They like to possess the living and make them do heinous things. A lot of times, sadly, it's to unalive someone. Kind of like Peter Pan's shadow, but instead of harmless mischief, it's folks, not waking up in the morning, if you know what I'm saying. And of course, where do I get my fix for Shimigamis? But from that one really popular anime about young people who really are emotional and being possessed by Shimigamis. Oh man, talk about scandal and drama. Huh. Number two, Loki. The god of mischief? Why, of course, we had to sneak in this little devil. We've seen variations of Loki on film, really. Tom Hiddleston does a great job in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but just how accurate is he to the real god of mischief? Well, Loki in Old Norse translates to close, but you don't want this one anywhere near you. Loki was known to cheat those around him, so often that his mouth had to be stitched shut. I mentioned the underworld earlier when I was talking about Hermes the messenger. Well, Loki is the father of hell, ruler of the land of the dead, the underworld. In our last collab, we mentioned why it's important to keep your pets on a leash and all. Well, Loki is the proud father of Fenrir, the massive wolf demon that historically was prophesized to eat Odin during Ragnarok. So yeah, a little scandalous I'd say. Number one, Kratos, the real Kratos in some depictions is the one who ordered poor Prometheus to be chained up, or does it himself, which is bad, that's, that's not cool. Chaining a dude up so that a big bird can eat his insides is a little crazy, it's a little scandalous too, but I'm gonna throw in the Kratos that most of us know today. Okay, yeah, it's a bit of a stretch, I know, I hear you. I think a lot of you will agree with me that they took lame, chains up Prometheus Kratos and turned him into the remorseful, bloodthirsty god with sun issues. 
Kratos. He's got a decent story arc though, that's pretty cool though, right? Plus, you know, the games are a lot of fun. The Kratos we love and know had left the world of Greek gods and after pretty much destroying them all, made it to Norse land. That's right, crossing mythology. That's, that's pretty scandalous. Taylor agrees. How much more scandalous can you get? That's like celebrities when they try to reinvent themselves. Sure, Robert Downey Jr. is Iron Man, and he's great, but some folks from a few years ago might remember his past. You can't hide from that, Greek god or not. Number 10, cold as the wind blows. Japan, we love the people, the food, the culture, and the samurai, because let's be honest, armored gentlemen of high morals with really sharp swords is just cool. Kublai Khan, being not as cool as Japan, said to himself, and his massive ever-growing army, we should go get some cool from Japan. And go to get cool they did. While some initial boat crossings and evasions went okay, two very notable instances where it did not go very well for the Mongol invaders. The worst incident being on August 12, 1281. With a combined fleet of 4,400 ships, over 140,000 Mongol warriors were ready to invade. When seemingly a large typhoon came out of nowhere and devastated the Mongol forces, with at least half of the men drowning and only a few hundred ships remained. Casualties were very high. Those that made it to shore were hunted down by the 40,000 samurai awaiting battle. Shortly after the typhoon was dubbed the Divine Wind and was thought to be a gift from the gods. Holy for Japan, unholy for the Khan. Number 9. Ninja Vanish Samurai are distinguished by their colorful leather armor and katanas that are forged with great care and a code of honor that was upheld at all costs. But they were not the only warriors of ye olde times in Japan. The ninja needs no introduction, but here it goes anyway. Stealthy warriors cloaked in black who were hired for tactical espionage and a really weird movie with turtles eating pizza with a rat. They were mercenaries hired by Diamos and even samurai to get the misdeeds of war done. Sabotage and assassination were necessary in the rebellious and political climate Japan found itself in. It would see many political shifts and leaders fighting for control of a unified and fractured Japan. Number 8. My Eyes! As previously mentioned, the ninja were stealthy warriors who did the dirty jobs no one else could, specifically samurai, as the Bushido Code literally forbade them from it. And honestly, they were kind of high sniffing their own farts, as they felt a lot of things were below them, including ninjas. I for one would not want to disrespect such a worthy foe. What the ninja lack in a full military force or simply being in a traditional battle, they make up for it with their tactics and weapons. Equipped with a variety of weapons with a variety of uses, the most unholiest weapon in the ninja's arsenal was the Mitsubishi egg, not to be confused with Mitsubishi. A small container of sorts that held dirt and dust that when used would blind and disorientate the enemy. The worst flavor of this egg being filled with crushed glass. Yeah, crushed glass in the eye. It caused excruciating pain and would be quite difficult to deal with medically at the time. Honestly, who throws glass in eyes? Number 7. You can't come in. Tokugawa Lamitsu was the big bad shogun in power. And when you're the big bad shogun in power, you get to make big bad decisions. He ushered in the beginning of the Edo period, one that would see Japan prosper for a while, but it did eventually decline. Perhaps the worst part of this time was Japan's isolation. Japan basically locked itself in its bedroom and with the roar of prepubescent rage, told the world not to come into my room. Tokugawa forbade any Japanese ships from leaving and anyone from entering. The penalty for disobeying such rule was death. Japan was nervous at the time as many European nations were beginning to colonize, and if they could rip apart a dynasty like China, surely they would be next. This isolation period lasted over 200 years, and while the world moved on, Japan kind of stayed frozen in time. Of course, like most laws, they get broken, and on the southern tips of Japan's coast, there was some important trading with the Dutch, but we won't tell anybody. Number 6. Manifest Destiny Looking back on history, the United States and Japan are probably most recognized together as being combatants of that one war with that weird mustache guy, whatever it was called, and that war ending in the worst party favor ever, honestly. But that wasn't the first time these two nations met. It was a beautiful summer day in 1853 when just off the shores of Tokyo Bay, some strange ships came into view. They were American ships with cannons and they came bearing gifts to the emperor, and a very real ultimatum that can be summed up as, my friends, you have been closed for too long, open for trade, or else be annihilated, then open for trade. 
After some time, the Japanese really didn't have a choice. They dissolved the 200 year order to be isolated. The Americans were looking for trade, but in truth, a large motivation for their forced opening of Japan was manifest destiny. God, God bless America. God bless them. Number 5. When in Rome. Having a large quantity of warships in your harbor with shiny new weapons and technology is bad for one's health. But worse than that, it puts you in a position to be colonized. And to be fair, there was a good chance of that happening. From multiple nations actually. So when given an ultimatum, it was time to make a decision. But perhaps this wasn't all bad. The Japanese actually came up with a rather good solution. What if we take all the new technology and run with it? Maybe it's time to colonize some places ourselves, thought a room full of people ready to overthrow the feudal government with modern technology. And that's exactly what they did. An event in Japanese history called the Meiji Restoration was just that. What's unholy about the whole thing is how fast they did it. Restoring the imperial reign but at the same time making it a very modern one. Within a few years it had become the most powerful superpower in Asia. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Number 4. The Last Samurai Japan went from feudal kingdoms to an imperial powerhouse maybe too quickly. Samurai for the longest time were a part of Japanese nobility. Swords were hired that became so rich and powerful that they essentially became the government themselves. So when the Meiji Restoration came about, the use of knights for hire really wasn't necessary with an imperial army and government. Tensions rose as the Samurai Rebellion had broken out. The Samurai of the old world with traditional weapons, some firearms, and the new and powerful Imperial Japanese army with modern weapons and lots of soldiers. After Imperial Japanese victory, Japan would shortly begin its expansion and colonization of Asia, taking the stage as a major world player. Number 3. Stomach Pains If you know anything about Japanese history, you knew this was coming. No, not the Logan Paul incident, but seppuku, the tradition of unaliving yourself with the most pain possible. Look, you gotta give samurai credit. They follow that Bushido code to the T. I mean, I can't even commit to a good book sometimes. But as crazy as the tradition sounds to us, to the samurai, honor means everything. Often done when defeated or disgraced, it's a ritual knife to the belly, and see you soon in the afterlife, oh mighty emperor. The most well known case of this was the tale of the 47 Ronin, who, after being disgraced and avenging their master, were granted seppuku by the shogun. The story has been told in many plays and even some films. Number 2. Tis but a scratch, sir. Katanas are beautiful pieces of art in warfare. Just ask anyone at an anime convention, they'll tell you. But in all seriousness, a lot of time and effort goes into constructing a samurai blade. One might even say the blacksmith's soul gets put into every strike of his hammer. So when the blade is completed, you gotta test drive it. Make sure it's sharp. To test the sharpness of a samurai edge, you would use bamboo, animals, and the occasional criminal. This practice was called Tameshigiri. That's right. They would test it on people. But I mean, what better way to know what your sword is gonna do than by knowing what it's going to do? Katanas could easily remove limbs from torsos. Records of these events have provided some knowledge of the human body's resistance to edge weapons. Thanks, Samurai. And number one, artsy brothels. Geisha women wore beautiful kimono robes and were oftentimes mistaken for being courtesans. While in some cases that is true about geishas, they were more like me. Wait, what? All jokes aside, they were more humble hosts for these pleasure quarters, <laughs> oftentimes entertaining men before the scandalous behavior occurred. This was a time of great cultural and artistic expansion in Japan. So these pleasure houses were legal. A lot of these women, while not having the same amount of freedom and choice as today, actually did have more than their European counterparts. Nice. Number 10. The Sins of Our Fathers Law and Order is not just a hit drama from the 90s with a killer soundtrack but something that started with the civilizations a very long time ago. King Hammurabi and his code of law comes to mind. But today, we're talking about ancient Persia. We're talking about a corrupt judge named Sisimans. After taking a bribe and delivering a not so unbiased verdict, the king found out and was most displeased. This is one of the worst things to do to another human being, but poor Sisimans was flayed. Or in simpler terms, they done skin that feather alive. To make an unholy situation even more uncomfortable, they made a chair and used his hide as a material and made his son sit in the flesh chair to make his own judgments. Can't help but think that you'd be sitting there all day thinking of dear old dad because you're sitting on top of a chair that's kind of fuzzy because dad had a lot of back hair. Yikes. 
Number nine, the annual purge. I don't know about you folks at home, but I love the holiday season. For me specifically, Christmas. And to me, the meaning of Christmas is something less to do with religious background, but just good cheer. Spending time with loved ones and friends, and really enjoying a nice homemade meal. I mean, come on, turkey with a stuffing. <laughs> Can't go wrong there. And honestly, you can't beat a good stuffing. I love it. But looking back at ancient Persia, there was a different kind of holiday. One that also has its roots in uh, less about religion and more about cold-blooded killings. There were Zoroastrian priests called the Magi, and although they weren't Persian, they were somewhat respected in Persian culture. But when a plot to overthrow the king was enacted, the Persians were not too happy, and slaughtered the people responsible for the coup. But just for good measure, they also slaughtered all the other priests in the palace. Okay, but they might have missed some outside in the city and they had to get them too. You know what, how about every year on this day we go on a magi hunt? So it became a holiday. Every year on the day of the coup, there was a grand feast and then a hunt for the remaining survivors. That's really comforting, that's nice. Number eight, poaching. It's 2021, we all know it's super uncool to poach. Illegally hunting endangered species for fun or just one sought after piece of the animal like elephant tusks for ivory. Our Persian friends of the past just might have been partaking in the poaching of rhinos. While in the ancient world the laws of today were not around to protect animals, the reason was still there and people wanted horns. For some reason, however, people thought that rhino horn held the power to purify water. Thus, it was used to detect poisonous liquids. It's a superstitious belief that actually would be carried on for a very long time. Rhino horn did have other uses in civilizations, but I like to think it was a coolness factor. You can't tell me drinking wine out of a hollowed out horn isn't cool, come on. Number seven, Marvin's room. Hey man, it's okay. We've all been there. We all felt that kind of hurt before. You're drunk, it's 3 a.m. in a big city with lights. She hurt you bad, dude. But you should just call her. Just see if she picks up. Maybe you shouldn't. Maybe you should get really drunk and then come up with a solution and then see if it still sounds like a solid plan in the morning when you're sober. Yeah, when ancient Persians had a big decision to make, they used dad wisdom. Get super drunk and then think about critical events in life that require tough decision making. And when you're sober in the morning, do it drunk you thought. Being honest was a big part of Persian culture. And when are people at their most honest? So the theory kind of makes sense to me. I just know that when I wake up in the morning after nurturing a case of beer, that last night's thoughts don't always translate well in the morning. Number six, the land of milk and honey. Another creative punishment for the people who want to lose sleep tonight, a punishment for crimes Persians had come up with was scapism. This is where the Persians would feed a convicted criminal milk and honey. Sounds awesome, right? Well, not exactly. See, they entrap the person between two boats, and every day they would force feed someone milk and honey. Milk and honey, milk and honey. Over and over and over again. Also, slathering the mixture of the two on the poor helpless criminal. As time went on, flies and bugs would find themselves interested in a sweet smelling crook. As one must also use the bathroom after all that beautiful rich consumption. A true horror to see, but after enough time, the person who was unlucky enough to be in such a position slowly and painfully died in a bog of their own filth and rodent infested area. Most likely dying of septic shock. I don't even have a joke for this one. This is something that should just be in the next Saw movie. Ugh. Number five, ashes to ashes. Here's another fun punishment. Man, these guys are really creative. This one is mentioned in the Bible, so you know it's gonna be good. Basically, the Persians built a tower, and it was filled with ash. Drop criminals into the ash tower, or there were two large paddles connected to the turning wheels outside that would churn the ash and victim inside, suffocating on the hot ash. Making for a hot and dusty storm of hell and unholy foulness I can't even begin to describe. Like most things in history from this time, it has to be taken with a grain of salt. It could be very true, or not so true. As the Persian Empire did not leave us with much, and most knowledge of them comes from Greeks and Greek historians. But like most stories, there's truth in everything. And if that's even close to the truth, well, that's just not right, man. Number four, this is Sparta. Despite what a 2006 movie with spray on abs might mislead you, the Battle of Thermopylae was no laughing matter. It pitted the very brave Spartans against the Persian invaders. And there were a lot of them. 
like really a lot of them. Attack after attack after attack, the Persians were not getting anywhere. It wasn't until one of the Greeks betrayed the Spartans by leaving the Persians on a flank that would result in the destruction of the Spartans. Although the Persians were victorious, it wasn't in a sense a Pyrrhic victory, as the loss of life on the Persian side far outnumbered the deaths of the Spartans. It's a battle that would be remembered for its bravery, and enough to have a movie made about it many, many years later. Number 3. Here comes the boy. So after a failed attack on Greece, Persia was kinda down about that. No money in the treasury meant that the once great Persian empire was on the decline. So what better time to invade? And that's just what Alexander the Great did. Through a very lengthy campaign that lasted 10 years and a very formidable fighting force, most likely the strongest ever at the time, he shattered the declining Persian Empire. He even managed to capture the city of Babylon. Talk about kicking a guy while he's down. His rule of the Persian Empire unfortunately was short lived, as he died not too long after that at the ripe old age of 32. Boy, I sure hope I live to the ripe age of 32. Number 2 The Protection of Meow. Before the Persian Empire was no more, they were actually a very powerful empire. So powerful that they wanted a piece of Egypt. This war may have also been started by an insult from the pharaoh, but expanding was probably more likely. What makes this war so notable is the absolute five head play by Persia. Persia knew of the Egyptian culture and knew about their idolization of cats. So, to aid them in the invasion, the king advised them to use kitty power. Soldiers were painting cats and the god Bastet in order for Egyptians to not dare destroy an image of their god. More ridiculous than that was the use of live cats. Stray cats were rounded up and kept during battle in order to prevent the very lethal arrow fire. Soldiers still died in battle, but it is said that the cats gave enough of an advantage for there to be a Persian victory. Decent. Number 1. Progressive for the time. Looking back in time, we can all acknowledge that maybe we weren't so nice. And as time has moved on, we've gotten more progressive. When you think of ancient empires, you don't really think of progressive, but surprisingly Persia was for the time. Specifically women's rights. Women were free to move about. They were allowed to work and be higher ups and manage. But probably the most important aspect was the right to own business and property, which their European counterparts simply could not do. Look at you Asian Persia, way to go, look at you. Kicking off the list at number 10, Gladiator Blood. Okay, nice and thirsty this morning, so let's talk about gladiator blood so we can get nice and hydrated for this video. When Charlie Sheen started talking smack about drinking dragon blood, everybody looked at him like this guy was insane. But back then, back in ancient Roman days, if you boasted about drinking gladiator blood, that's great, you were on the right track. Something's, something's working for you, pal. Keep it up. Ancient Romans believed that gladiators had the literal heart of a lion, and to be fair, they were in immaculate shape and they looked like lions with their glorious hair. I'm attracted to Romans, uh, most of them. So the thought process here being extremely superstitious was that if you drank said gladiator blood, whatever disease you had would soon be cured. Yes, the strong heart of a lion, blood. Yeah, if you have some epilepsy, uh, Roman physicians would tell you to drink some blood, like you're a vampire. Yeah, here you go. Here you go, Edward, enjoy, hope you feel better. Number nine, you're in trouble. Recently, we did a list on dark medical practices used in history, and in that list, we mentioned briefly about how urine was used by ancient Romans to whiten their smile. Yeah, fresh breath, not guaranteed. Actually, this time at all, it's really not. It's the opposite, in fact. Well, to dive deeper into this gross, disgusting fact, ancient Romans also used urine to wash their clothes. Yep. <laughs> That's so gross. I was like, I'll be, I'll be no one peeing on them. There we go. After they were done washing up, they would mask the smell, or at least try to, with uh, leaves. Yeah, they would use bay leaves. Yeah, they didn't use soap because, well, the amount of ammonia in urine did the trick, so there was no need at that point. Yeah. Lye was also used to clean clothes at this time, but it was too pricey. So plan B was to head down to the, you know, washrooms, the old ancient laundromat. Same thing, really. They are pretty close. And then everybody would catch up while, you know, stomping and urinating and cleaning out their clothes. It was, it was a good time. Number eight, new hair, new me. As soon as I cut my hair, I'm not gonna lie, I felt great. There's less weight on the neck, I could be more free in my silly movements when I do these lists. Glowing up these days is easier than ever. You know, the tutorials on YouTube as well, you can learn how to do your brows while hearing true crime. It's amazing what we have nowadays. The Romans, not that easy. They had to do a little more work back then. If you were an ancient Roman and you wanted to show off the new you to your ex, maybe you're at a vomitorium party and you, and you see your ex maybe perhaps, how would you dye your hair? How would you get their attention? How do you show Romulus that blondes do in fact do it better, right? Romans would have to use goat fat and beech wood ashes to bring out those highlights, yeah. Maybe it's goat fat, maybe it's Maybelline. 
Maybe it's disgusting. It's definitely disgusting. Again, like those crazy Roman parties, this was a symbol of status, right? If your hair didn't reek of goat fat, um, who are you? You're not on the list, honey. Goat fat or bust, I don't speak broke. See ya. Emperor Claudius, his third wife, Valeria, apparently she once dyed her hair blonde and painted her entire body gold, and then had a contest to see who could hook up with the most Romans in one night. Yeah, Bachelor in Paradise, Pompeii edition. Tune in, it's night at eight. Number seven, party hard. The term boot and rally was added to the Urban Dictionary back in 2002, pretty recent. But Romans, they were doing that a long time ago. They were riding that wave out a long, long time ago. They were ahead of the game. They knew how to get down. All those ancient parties, well, rather, they knew how to get it back up. Ancient Romans would often make themselves throw up in order to continue eating and drinking because it was a social status. Yeah, what would normally be a red flag at a house party was a sign of respect back then. But it was business. These parties were literally business meetings. These long, exhausting banquets. Attending these was a sign of social standing. So you wanted to be around the longest. You wanted to drink the most. You wanted to dance the most. And you wanted to ideally puke the most. Those are the coolest Romans in town, right? You ever see a Roman gagging? You know, he's, he's getting some stuff done in the city. Ah, oh, he's like, oh, excuse me. <laughs> oh. The solution back then was to throw it up and then continue. So you can, you know, excuse yourself from dinner, go to the vomitorium, right across from the dining room. How convenient, must be a nice breeze rolling through there, I'm sure. But then you would go to this room, grab a feather, and then tickle oh, thy throat, and then make room for even more lobster. Yeah, they have a thing that holds uh, feathers. So you just go in and go, oh, a blue one. And then you shove it down your mouth, and then put it back in. After you dry it off first, you gotta put it back in. Number six, bathroom hangouts. Bathroom lighting is key when you go out, okay? Those 1 a.m. selfies have to look good. That's the whole point, or else why are we going out? Why am I putting on shoes, right? The curls aren't working, I'm not going outside, that's it. In ancient Roman times, hanging out in the bathroom with your friends was common. They didn't have any neon lights or anything cool. They didn't have Arctic monkeys playing or any cool atmospheres. It was just a lot of bricks. And also, it of course smelled really bad. They didn't have the Charmin Ultra Less Is More lifestyle either. They had to use sticks with sponges to wipe. And yeah, they also, same with the feathers, they had to share said sticks. Socializing in these ancient toilets was like socializing at a Starbucks. It was normal, it was business. You know, you would spend hours here and you got stuff done. Groups of Romans would discuss business, politics, military strategies, you name it. All the while, there's a dude in the corner just taking a <laughs> Romans believed the goddess Glochina was the guardian of the toilet drain system. Glocha Maxima translates to big drain. So when you invent the flushing toilet, yeah, you're obviously, you're like, this is some higher power. You can call your toilets whatever you want, you know? Just maybe don't call any more meetings there because uh, it smells a little bad. Number five, no soap. Look, sometimes you're in a rush, you don't have time to shower, so you do the classic Axe Body Spray X, you know? The old one, two. Do you remember that, Chris? Oh, yeah. It was yeah. so cold, too, on the armpits. Wow. Yeah, like, yo, no wonder I can't grow armpit hair. I've been spraying, like, aerosol. I've been spraying spray paint on my armpits every morning since I was, like, nine. I still use it sometimes. Axe chocolate? No contest, so good. Ancient Romans, they were way ahead of the game. They didn't clean their clothes with laundry detergent like I mentioned earlier. It's not shocking to hear that they also didn't use soap to wash their bodies, no. Instead, they rubbed perfume oil all over themselves to get rid of sweat and all that jazz. But later on, once said oil had dried up, they then removed it with a wooden wedge or a spatula, a tool called a striggle, and they just peel it off. I kind of like that idea. Whenever I burn in the summer, I'm like, ooh, let me pull this neck slowly. It's the world's most painful loofah, essentially. Dirt and sweat would get stuck to this oil and then subsequently peeled off. So it worked, but it took a little more time than our showers nowadays. For Romans who were well off, this of course was a whole event. There were several, you know, assistants. You could pick all these fancy fragrant oils. It was slow and sensual. It was like fun, dare I say. How was anybody ever on time? Like, oh, sorry I was late. You know, those, those oil baths I had to stick around for four hours this morning and get peeled. It's crazy. Number four, Roman art. This one reminds me of Superbad a lot, and you'll understand why. Back in the 18th century, when excavations took place in the city of Pompeii, they found lots and lots of art, all with a similar theme. A similar, everything looked like a certain body part. An eggplant-ish theme. There were carvings in the streets, there were carvings of these things in the walls, under a street sign, you name it. They're just everywhere. Just rich history carved in all over. We're still finding these uh, today. They're called the Phalluses of Pompeii. Yeah, imagine tripping over one of these. Then you do that thing where you look back to see what you almost rolled your ankle on. You look back and see that. You're like, oh, what? Some dude in Pompeii got you like thousands of years ago. 
just chiseling out a... Many tour guides like to say that they all point and lead to a brothel, when in reality, that's a lie. These were all just for good luck. These symbols were to ward off the evil eye. Most folks kept these outside the front of their homes, right next to the mailbox. <laughs> Coming with mail, you're like... Number three, animals in the Colosseum. In order to spice up the classic fight and clash swords till someone's not alive anymore, sometimes gladiators would be put in the arena with an animal instead of another human being to, you know, spice it up, just to spice up those Saturday night shows, I guess. People are crazy. Were they squirrels? Or were they tigers, elephants, bears, leopards, lions, hyenas, or wolves? The latter. It was all the scary big animals. Animals were very expensive, so they weren't used every day, but the organizers of these battles would go all out for the fights that did include them. Everyone would pile in. It's kind of like Logan Paul versus Mayweather, you know, these big social events. We're like, well, what else are we doing, you know? Let's go watch. Most animals that were used in these great battles unfortunately didn't make it out alive. That's the horrible part. I'm a big animal lover, so that's hard to read. This led to other important factors down the road. People loved when animals were included that eventually trade in exotic animals took place. That's where it all started. This quickly took the hippo from the Nile, for example, and then made them extinct. That's how they did that. Cut to today, thousands of species are going extinct more and more. You know what, let's just bring gladiators back. Let's just do it. UFC, put them in armor. Let's see what happens. That'd be hilarious. Release all the animals from zoos and then bring back just gladiators. Life, life will be fixed. Number two, naval battles. Have you ever heard about staged naval battles in the Colosseum? It's a weird spectacle, but it wouldn't have been that crazy. It sounds a lot bigger and more lavish than it really was. The Colosseum was flooded at this point, which I'm sure took a hot minute, and then these ships would come out, and then it would be like medieval times almost, but with a splash zone. A really dirty splash zone. These ships were designed to resemble vessels from famous battles before, but the bottom of the ship was flat, right? These were fake boats, obviously. The water was only five feet deep, so obviously they couldn't use, you know, real ships or anything like that. It was all show. It wasn't always violent reenactments either though, as funny as that sounds when you think of the Roman Colosseum. Sometimes they would fill the Colosseum and have nude, synchronized swimmers as a show. Imagine that, imagine traveling the land and then you get there, you're like, oh, let's watch some action. And it's just like ballet. And they're like, oh, this is actually quite nice. I like this a lot. Yeah, also goggles weren't invented until the 14th century. So they had to swim underwater like, oh, this is so gross. Their poor eyes. These naval stories were doing so well that Emperor Domitian devoted an entire lake to them now. Like the Goblet of Fire, people would walk to a lake to watch these insane shows. Only once the shows moved over there permanently, they then used the Colosseum's old floodgates to hide those animals in. So it was, you know, we love upgrades, I guess. It sucks, it all, it, it's all bad. And finally, number one, audience troubles. Okay, what's it like watching these ancient Colosseum shows? Was it fun? Was it horrifying to watch? Were you... Like, the, the PTSD from these shows alone. When the Colosseum was built in 80 AD, about 50 to 80,000 fans of Roman combat would pour in often. The energy is high. This was their only entertainment. They were watching The Witcher season three, you know what I mean? Some fans would get so into the action that they, of course, would heckle, like we do nowadays with like UFC. People would be watching like, oh, throw the right hook, throw this thing. They would obviously do the same. But in Roman Colosseum days, you didn't get a warning if you heckled, you know what I mean? One of Rome's more violent emperors, Domitian, how I mentioned earlier, he was pretty uh, diehard about the Colosseum and their games. So much so that one day, a guy in the crowd was heckling a gladiator so much, he was probably, you know, talking smack about his oiled up abs or something like that. So Emperor Domitian had him pulled from the audience to the center of the arena. And then he had to fight to survive. He didn't get out alive, obviously. It was all bad, so yeah, don't huckle. Don't huckle? Don't huckle or heckle. Don't huckle or heckle or heckle. How terrifying is that? Can you imagine heckling and then getting called out? Agent Coliseum times. Hey, Maximus, smile. Me? At number 10, the creation. Every religion and civilization from the dawn of humanity has come up with their own unique stories as to how the world was created. Some civilizations have credited aliens, others have credited a benevolent god, and many of these gods have their own unique ways of creating life. Though we've heard stories of gods creating people out of things like corn or mud or just thin air, I don't think these stories could even compare to the ancient Egyptian story of creation. These ancient people believed that their very first god, Atum, created himself. As such, he had no wife and literally no one else to potentially procreate with, and so to create his and thus create humanity, he, well, he busted Literally, he just gave himself a one to meat massage and boom. Out of that process, he created his kids, Shu and Tefnut. 
a very fitting name if you ask me. This legend, I guess you could say, created the term the god's hand. And this was used to refer to women back in ancient Egypt, since Atum's hand played the quote unquote female role in the creation of his offspring. This term was also carried over into other civilizations, like in the Greco Roman period, so if you ever hear someone say god's hand, now you know where that came from. At number nine, cheating death. These days, if you get caught cheating on your partner, the worst that could happen to you is you break up, or you get a divorce, or maybe even get exposed on social media. But back in the times of ancient Egypt, the punishment for adultery was much, much worse than having your relationship end. Instead, your life would be the thing that ends. Obviously, in any civilization, any kind of relationship can always happen outside of a marriage. The only varying difference is the punishment for it. For the ancient Egyptians, being caught having an adulterous relationship was punishable by death. Pretty harsh for having a sneaky link, but I guess they took their relationships much more seriously back then. One of the most famous cases of a serial adulterer, if you will, came from a man named Peneb, who was known to sleep with many married women and even had his own son join in on his escapades too. As you can imagine, things didn't really end well for them, so if you ever go back in time to ancient Egypt, just be careful of who you sleep with. Before we continue talking about some of the things that your teachers might not have taught you about ancient Egypt, why not leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number eight, ancient WAP. Last year, there was a huge scandal concerning Cardi B and Meg Thee Stallion's song WAP. It's a pretty racy song that had a lot of people up in arms about it, and it was all over the news. I mean, if you ever heard any songs from the early 2000s, then you would know that this kind of musical content really isn't a new thing, and little songs have been a part of society for a really long time, but it might surprise you to know that they even had some risque songs even back in the times of ancient Egypt. Historians have discovered some of these songs, one of which I can recite to you, and it uses some pretty imaginative wording to describe a woman's body. In an excerpt from said song, it says, quote, the one, the sister without peer, the handsomest of all. She looks like the rising morning star. At the start of a happy year, shining bright, fair of skin, lovely the look of her eyes, sweet the speech of her lips, she has not a word too much. Upright neck, shining breast, her hair true lapis lazuli, arms surpassing gold, fingers like lotus buds, heavy thighs, narrow waist, her legs parade her beauty. With graceful steps she treads the ground, captures my heart with her movement." End quote. Now, it's no WAP, but for the ancient Egyptians, it was pretty spicy. At number seven, the ancient hub. Back in ancient times, people needed some spicy content to make themselves happy, you know? Before we had OnlyFans and The Hub, people in ancient Egypt had their own adult content to enjoy during their alone time. This piece of content was called the Turin Papyrus, and it was essentially just a scroll of a bunch of images on it with people getting busy in some frankly unimaginable positions. Like, I don't know when the Kama Sutra was created, but I feel like the Turin Papyrus certainly gave it a run for its money. The purpose of this papyrus is pretty much unknown, but there are some theories to explain its origin and why it was created, some thinking that it had political ties or something. Either way, historians use this document to further understand times in ancient Egypt. At number six, magic attraction. You know, we can't always have the best game when it comes to finding a partner. Sometimes it can be hard to get someone to go out with you. Many people just don't give up until they succeed, and sometimes that means that they will go to many lengths just to get a date with their crush. This was seen a lot in ancient Egypt, and at one point in later years of their civilization, they practiced magic to attract the one that they loved. Turns out that they practiced voodoo to get someone interested in them, and it was commonly done by men seeking out the woman of their dreams. In one case of this voodoo for love practice, a man had a magician make a voodoo doll of a woman that he wanted all to himself. The magician pierced the figurine with bronze nails and inscribed a tablet on it with a spell saying that this woman would not be able to drink, eat, or be with another man besides the one seeking her out. The spell also supposedly summoned a demon to follow her and pull her hair and intestines until she found her way to him. Sounds a little intense, but hey, I guess that's just what you do when you don't have Tinder. At number five, sneaky link. In ancient Egyptian literature, women were often portrayed as seductresses. One of the more famous stories telling the tale of a seductress is one called the tale of the two brothers. 
Essentially, the story goes that a man, his wife, and his younger brother all lived together. One day, the two men went out to do some farm work, and while they were out, the one man told his brother to go back to the house to get some grain sacks. When he reached the house, the wife noticed the brother and complimented him on his strength and tried to seduce him. The brother got angry and refused, but told the wife that he wouldn't say anything to her husband about their encounter. Still, she was worried that the brother would snitch, and so she made herself look like she had been beaten up, and when her husband returned, she pretended like the brother was the one who tried to seduce her. The husband got angry and threatened to kill his brother, but in an attempt to save his own skin, the brother told the husband the truth and even cut his bits off and threw his pee pee into the river just to prove his point, where it was promptly eaten by fish. Unfortunate. The husband then returned home to his wife, where he killed her and fed her to dogs. Not a happy ending for anyone, but it gives you a real sense of how adultery worked back in those days. At number 4, no Viagra. Just like anyone else these days, back in ancient Egypt, sometimes people had performance issues. Impotence was apparently a really big issue for many Egyptian men. It was such a common issue that sometimes it infiltrated their art and there were some scrolls and statues about it. An ancient Egyptian proverb was created about such a topic that said, quote, He who is shy to have intercourse with his wife will not get any children. Now obviously, there are things nowadays that can help with such an issue, but back then, people resulted to prayer and magic to help their little buddies out. Don't really know how well that worked out for them, but it's a struggle that a lot of people face, so at least they weren't alone. At number 3, LGBTQ+. As with anywhere on earth, there were same sex relationships, and the same goes for ancient Egypt. However, documentation of such things were far and few. The only 100% clear cut case of same sex relationships that was documented in ancient Egypt comes from the story of Horus and Seth. The story goes that Horus and Seth were both vying for the throne, and one night, Horus pretended to be drunk while Seth tried to take advantage of him while Horus slept. Not the greatest example, but it's what we've got that's actually confirmed. Another potential recorded gay relationship may have come from Egypt's King Pepu II, who was thought to have had a secret relationship with one of his generals at nighttime. One of the most well known potential gay relationships from those times, though, comes from a piece of Egyptian art that showed two men touching noses. Doesn't seem like anything too intimate, but back then, touching noses was another way of kissing. The two men depicted, though, were thought to be brothers, so it's theorized that there was something a little spicy going on there, but we don't have to think about that one too hard. At number two, dirty insults. What is your favorite insult? Don't be shy, you can tell me this is a safe space. I guess I have a number of favorites, but one that I quite enjoy is saying that someone's mother is a horker, like in Skyrim. Back in the times of ancient Egypt, however, insults often included some kind of note. If they needed to hurl an insult at someone, they might say something like, quote, may you copulate with a donkey, or may a donkey copulate with your wife. People would also combine some kind of note with pointing out someone's flaws to create an insult. In a note found from one of the people who built one of the great pyramids, they insulted one of their co-builders by saying, quote, you are not a man because you cannot get your wives pregnant like your fellow men. Like, damn, that's pretty cold, dude. And finally, at number one, the magic pee pee. <laughs> Now, I had to save this next fact for our number one spot because it's probably one of the most bizarre things that I've ever learned about ancient Egypt. The Egyptian god Min was the male fertility god, and let's just say that he was quite unique. He was known for his bold feathered headdress and the fact that his loincloth snake was always being charmed, if you get what I'm saying. Men suffering from impotence would make offerings to him to help them with their fertility problems. Even to this day, figures of the god Min are used in magic rites. Men and women still visit the ancient temples to find figures of the god and literally rub his to overcome their problems. Sounds strange, but apparently so many people have done it that the stone that it's carved into has become worn down or darkened from how many hands have touched it. Now I can only imagine what this god's body count was. Kicking off the list at number 10, the bird. The bird is not the word. It's actually pretty offensive. To flip somebody the bird or to flip somebody off, of course, means to give them the middle finger. What are these little troublesome guys right here, one of these blurry dudes right here. Do we even know why we do this? I mean, I don't recommend it because obviously you'll get in a heap of trouble from whoever's on the other end, the receiving end of said finger. But giving somebody the middle finger comes from the fourth century BC in Athens. The philosopher Dino Genes expressed how he felt visitors about Demosthenes. He described him by making a, well, you guessed it, a middle finger. It's a phallic gesture. The middle finger is supposed to be your, you know, the your bird, for lack of a better term. And the surrounding curled fingers are meant to be the 
you know, the other things that are around said thing on the body. I'm trying not to say what I really want to say here, but the bird is meant to, you know, it's supposed to be one of those. The more you know, ancient Greek history, who would have thunk? Number nine. Column wars. While the Greeks were going head to head with the Turks, they were fighting over their independence, of course, and the Greeks had the upper hand at Acropolis one day. They were surrounding their enemy and they had this stronghold in their grasp, and the Turks at the same time were running out of ammo and options. They then began to break apart the marble columns around them, just smashing them to pieces, just breaking them as fast as they can to try and get lead from inside and use that as ammo. Now, as the Greeks witnessed the destruction of their Parthenon, they panicked, obviously. They said, here, just take ammo instead. Whatever you do, just don't break those columns. We can keep fighting. In fact, we'll supply you the ammunition. Just don't break those columns. And they did. 1821 Greek War of Independence. Here you go, Ottoman Empire. Take this lead. Now we can fight. Let's do it. It's like when you're at a house party, they're like, just fight each other. Just don't put a hole in the wall. I'll be grounded. Seriously. I can't fix that. I don't know how to. Number eight, zombies. It doesn't matter what the context is. Zombies are always scared. Whenever we talk about ancient Egyptians, we break down the process of mummification. And you know what? I'll be honest, I missed that part. Just keep everything in jars. Keep everything separate in different rooms. Keep everything safe, surrounded by treasure in the middle of a tomb. No zombie is coming back to life if that's the case. You know what I mean? Well, ancient Greeks actually believed in zombies as well. They had steps they would take to prevent the dead from ever walking again. Archaeologists found graves where bodies were weighed down with rocks, or they would be pinned to their tombs. One of the two. Both pretty horrible. They weren't called zombies, of course, but rather revenants. Reanimated corpses that return to terrorize the living. AKA zombies. It's, it's a zombie. Dr. Solowski Weaver explains that bodies found at a cemetery near the ancient town of Camarina in southeast Sicily were feared to come back to life at one point. The town was once a Greek colony, of course now modern day Italy, but it's home to a third century cemetery with around 3,000 bodies in there. There's more than half of them that are buried with coins, the usual, but a few of them were found in specific ways, peculiar ways. One body found in tomb 653, their body was covered in large fragments of amphora. So it's whatever it was underneath there, they didn't want that to move. Which is weird, because you're like, okay, I know that they're dead, why are we putting a rock on them, you know? That, that fear, we still have it today. Number seven, stone cold. When the pandemic first began, one of the hardest things to get a hold of, surprisingly, was toilet paper. Yeah, it's pretty important. It's more important than we realized because that was the thing on the news that we saw. People just boxing each other out of Walmart for toilet paper. When you run out of toilet paper, you often remember that moment regardless of where you are forever. Leaves of three, let them be. That's all I'm saying. But ancient Greeks used these small ceramic pieces to wipe. Yeah, ceramic pieces, like sharp. French anthropologist Philippe Charlier expands on this toilet hygiene history in the British Medical Journal. It was these flat terracotta discs found in these ancient sites and they had residue on them, so the proof's in the pudding. They also discovered a Greek cup which said, three stones are enough to wipe one's arse. Three stones. See, even today, it's like three pieces, you know, three slices, three stones. It's always three. Yeah, Greeks would use pebbles to wipe their butts. Never take the go for granted ever again. Number six, naked exercise. Okay, this one, honestly, I'm just saying it's unusual, but I'm on board with it. You ever forget a towel when you're showering? You gotta do that weird naked silly run through the hallway. I'll be honest with you guys, that's my favorite run. I feel like one of those aliens from Signs, just walking around all light, naked, and lanky. Just meant for speed, you know, meant for greatness. Just wet, just like a lizard, just slipping around all over the kitchen. Ancient Greeks used to work out naked. The word gymnasium translates to the Greek term gymnasion, which meant school for naked exercise. Yeah, growing up, I always wanted to go to Xavier's school for gifted youngsters. Now, I just want to go to Ezekiel's school for naked exercise. Just don't set up shop behind the guy working on his squats. That's probably a bad idea. You know what? The more I think of this, the more I convince myself it's a pretty terrible idea. Hey man, do you mind spotting me? Sure. Number five, wine time. When we think of ancient Greeks, we think of wine and parties and apparently naked exercise, right? But was it really a drunken festival of love all the time? I mean, hangovers are a thing, right? We need some recovery days. When did Gatorade get invented? I don't know, this is it's probably hard to keep up. Ancient Greeks actually rarely drank wine without diluting the hell out of it first. To water the wine, the ratio was four to one or five to two. Either way, it's, it's just water at that point. So you'll be hydrated, that's for sure, which is great, but you're not really getting drunk, so I don't know what the point was. Regular Joes would drink at taverns and the rich would throw house parties, so some things, of course, have stayed the same after all these years, but ancient Greeks believed that drinking undiluted wine could cause blindness or insanity. My friend, I think that's just called blacking out. I don't know, who knows? If you did happen to drink too much wine, the fourth century poet, Amphis, he's got your back. 
Best way to cure those ancient hangovers was to boil some cabbage. Nice, just what you want to smell after a night out. And in order to keep the party going without embarrassing yourself off some sparkling Shiraz, the best way to party and stay sober was to bake and eat a pig's lung. That's the trick to never getting drunk in ancient Greek times. Again though, I think that was just eating food. I think eating food helps before you drink. Either way, if you're gonna drink, do so responsibly. Eat some pig lung and then you'll be good. Number four, bronze bowl. On a list of unusual things ancient Greeks did, I think it's fair to throw in the bronze or the brazen bowl. There was a bronze sculpture, often in the shape of a bowl. Yeah, obviously. Usually it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, it's, I think I saw this in a Saw movie one time. That's how, you know it's, that's how you know it's good. Once the person was locked inside, a fire would then be set underneath this bronze bowl, and then you could probably figure out the rest of that situation and what happens to the victim inside. We'll say victim inside, not person. Victim. Horrible, horribly, painfully... It's, it's all bad. They engineered the bowl so that when somebody screamed inside, it sounded like a bull's roar. That's haunting. That's actually really horrible. Every time I talk about this, I'm like, mm, this is real life. Real people did this. It was designed originally for Phalaris. He was a horrible ruler. He ruled around 560 BC, but the sculpture for Phalaris was built by Perilous, the guy who made the brazen bull. He was sadly the first victim. That's why you don't make torture devices, but I don't know. Number three, Greek statues. Okay, I'll lighten up the mood a little bit. The last one was a bit dark. We've all done this at one point. Maybe you're at a museum and you see a statue. It's right there in front of you. It's carved. It's pure beauty. It's massive. The warrior represented has like 15 abs. It's made of bronze, eight feet tall. The amount of detail gone into their body is jaw-dropping. Truly, it's impressive. But did you know that ancient Greeks would make their their, their bird uh, small on purpose? Uh? On purpose. Yeah, men who were well endowed were more often than not fools. They were foolish. Only They only ruled for lust, right? They were just craved fools with big birds. If you had a big brain, however, oh, you were the talk of the town. Ladies would whisper about you when you pass by in the street. Did you hear about Brian's big brain? Oh my God. He's got his dad's brain. Whenever an actor would play a fool on stage, they would be given a comedically large uh, setup. You know, that's how you know he's the villain or the fool, the bad guy in the scenario. The way we see these statues today meant that they had self-control and intelligence. I always thought they were just in a cold room when they were getting their stuff carved, but that's what this channel's for. History, but make it a little silly. Number two, the Battle of Marathon. Every New Year's, there's always that one guy on Facebook or Instagram who just becomes a runner just overnight. Just, they have a little squirt water belt thing that they they shoot it, you know, the whole thing, the whole setup, and they train ideally for a marathon. That's the big thing that they talk about for an entire year, this marathon. What is a marathon? Was it a person or is it just a name for 42 kilometers? Well, it was actually a battle back in 490 BC. That's how it kicked off. Between ancient Greeks and Persian invaders sent by King Darius, the Persians arrived to Marathon, there was about 20,000 of them, and they arrived to punish the Greeks for supporting the Lonians, who revolted against the Persians. Now the Greeks were outnumbered here at this point, but they attacked hard and they attacked fast. They took out 6,000 Persians and eventually they just fled the scene entirely. The number of Greek fighters lost was around 200, so far less casualties. The story of Phidippides came to be at this time. He ran the first ever marathon. He ran all the way from Marathon to Athens to deliver messages because Blackberry wasn't a thing, obviously. So some guys had to be like, you bet. <laughs> Imagine servers back then, they're like, would you want a large soda? You got. He was one of the Greek military men known as day long runners. He did six marathons back to back. My knees hurt just saying that, you know what I mean? So next time you see somebody on Facebook become a marathon runner, just post a link to this video and be like, you got it. You're almost, just do six in a row and you're good. Also do six in a row naked in the heat and you're good. And finally, number one, human sacrifice. Of course, we gotta end on something crazy like this. We found the remains of a 3000 year old skeleton in Greece. And they found the skeleton on the side of Mount Lycaon, which historians know as the site of animal sacrifice for Zeus. I don't know why I pointed up, but probably not down or, yeah, Zeus, he's up there, yeah. Ancient writers mentioned this site and how human sacrifice was also at play here. And now, thanks to technology, we can confirm that this was for sure the case. We talked about zombies earlier and how bodies would be buried with like rocks in them and stuff. This is a bit different. This is actually much different. The upper part of the skull that was found was missing, first of all, and the body was laid on two lines of stones with stone slaps just laid on their pelvis. Now, Greece, of course, is the birthplace of philosophy and democracy and all that good stuff, but they also did some sacrificial shady stuff in their off time as well when they weren't slamming water down Merlot. Science allowed us to look all over the world too, not just Greece. There's ancient Egyptians, Aztecs, sometimes after Mayan ball games, the losing team would be sacrificed. Yeah, that's pretty brutal. Everyone talks about how awful humans are now. Well, we've always been the worst. The Greeks just like to party while they were doing it. 
Christ. Number 10, King Henry the First. We've all been there. Mostly on holidays where the food was just so good, we couldn't stop eating, we got so full, we wish we could die. I personally could talk about food for hours. I have a 10 minute limit with my boyfriend because uh, otherwise it just gets out of hand. True story. What is also a true story is that King Henry the First died from eating too much of his favorite thing. Henry loved a medieval delicacy called lamprey pie, a jawless giant leech like fish that was like sweetened with syrup. It was really gross and weird, but he loved it. He died at Lyons La Forêt near Rouen, Normandy in December 11th. 35 CE. He was supposed to go hunting, but had eaten so much lamprey pie that he fell sick with food poisoning. His chronicler, Henry of Huntington, said that he died due to a surfeit of lamprey. He wanted to have his body taken to Reading, which was a monastery he founded with 200 monks. They had to wrap his body in cowhide, cover it in herbs, scented oil, and salt, and remove his organs in order to preserve him for the journey. The man who removed his brain reportedly died due to a strong, pervasive stench. So not only did the king die, he took someone else down with him. Number nine, King Alexander. And no, this is not about Alexander the Great, different guy. Though he did die mysteriously as well. Maybe we'll cover that in part two if it so pleases you, let us know in the comments. I'm actually talking about Alexander who was king of Greece for a while in the 20th century. He ruled for all of three years until he died, tragically, after being bit by a monkey. Yep. That's true, yes, a monkey. Not a tiger, not a lion, a crocodile, or a hippo, a monkey. Sadly, this is his legacy. This is all people remember of him. <laughs> he took up the throne after World War I after his father abdicated because he was seen as pro-German. After the Allies won, a political platform called Great Greece began. Their aim was to capture the Ottoman Empire and seize all of their land. They invaded Turkey, but Alexander was fated for another destiny. He was visiting the Royal Gardens on September 30th, 1920, and was strolling along with his dog, they came across a Barbary macaque monkey and his dog attacked. The king rushed forward to separate them, but the monkey had friends. Another monkey rushed forward to protect his buddy and bit the king in the leg, which later became severely infected. Doctors acted too late to remove the leg, and so he died three weeks later from sepsis. He was only 27, and he was remembered because he died from being bit by a monkey. Number eight, Phalaris. What goes around comes around. Despite the actual death being very dramatic, it does have a kind of poetic justice to it. Polaris was referred to as the tyrant of Agragas Sicily. This guy made cruelty look like an art form. He was known for punishing his victims by putting them into a bronze bowl that he would heat with fire beneath. Yes, I'm talking about the brazen bull, a hollowed out bronze bull that would transform the cries of its prisoner into the bellows of a bull as it slowly roasted to death. Cruel entertainment. The first person to be punished was allegedly the designer of the contraption himself. He gained power after taking on the responsibility of building a temple of Zeus. He armed his workers and seized power, but they would soon all regret it. A man named Telemachus eventually overthrew this horrific ruler, and you guessed it, he was thrown into the very bull he used to unalive countless people. Ouch. Number seven, King Richard the Lionheart. Look, we all know I'm on the Richard the Lionheart train because I just finished reading about the Third Crusade. Madness, utter madness, Richard was born for battle. Saladin had never faced nor encountered any warrior like him. They were so equally matched. Saladin was also really awesome. I should do a video about him. Saladin would watch him fight and was in such awe he sent him two of his best horses in the middle of a battle because such a man should not be without his horse. He would literally like, like, plow through his enemies like a bulldozer, at times falling ill due to the stench of battle but never succumbing to it. He had so many encounters with death that he seemed to be like invincible, immortal even. Which is why his death is so strange to me and so anticlimactic. He was walking towards a battlement un armored and a vengeful boy took advantage and shot him in the arm with an arrow. Richard jumped on his horse and went to a doctor, but the doctor was terrible at his job, basically butchered his arm and caused him to get gangrene, therefore a death sentence. He had the bowman brought to him and asked him why he was his downfall, and this is where it kind of gets really crazy. The boy replied that Richard had slain his father and brother and that he would accept any punishment he was given. Crazy. Richard was so in awe of the guy that he ordered instead that the boy not be harmed and instead be given enough money to live out the rest of his days happily. Sadly though, after Richard died, people were so bereft that his wishes were ignored and the bowman was punished and killed. So very, very sad, but what an anticlimactic death for Richard the Lionheart, but also what a proud thing to do. Number six, Caracalla. I'm going to try and avoid bathroom humor as much as I can. 
but feel free to go wild in the comments. Have you ever been in the bathroom doing your business and suddenly your mind starts going and you're like, someone could easily take me out right now, you know? I mean, it's not like you can just stop what you're doing, you know, before hands reach out and grab you beneath the stall and you're like, ah, you know, like what a way to go, right? Exactly. Which is kind of why it's bad form to assassinate someone in that vulnerable space. Poor Roman Emperor Caracalla. I mean, not really, though he gave Roman citizenship to free inhabitants. He, he is considered as one of the most bloodthirsty tyrants in Rome, so not a great guy. His reign is one of the main reasons the empire fell. He made a lot of people angry, let's just say that. In 217, the emperor was preparing for a major campaign against the Parthian Empire. He was visiting a temple nearby when he was stabbed by a Roman soldier who was allegedly angry with him for not promoting him. While this was happening, he was busy relieving himself on the side of the road and he was just dead. Ugh. Bad form. But also, you know, not a good guy. Number five, Queen Caroline of Ansbach. I'm not gonna lie, this is not for anyone with a weak stomach, so be careful. This is not a good way to go. One of history's goriest deaths to be sure. Queen Caroline was the consort of George II. She was described as extremely clever, intelligent, strong in character. However, later in life, she became overwhelmed with extreme bouts of gout. They became so bad that she had to be wheeled around the castle in an ornate chair. The cause was a strangulated hernia, which developed after the birth of her youngest. Eventually, the pain became so bad that she couldn't leave her bed. Her womb had ruptured and she was bleeding internally. And then, I'm so sorry, her bowels exploded. Exploded. On November 20th, 1737, Caroline passed away, leaving behind this epigram. Here lies, wrapped in 40,000 towels, the only proof that Caroline had bowels. Ugh, not a great legacy. Sorry, girl. Number four, a deadly throne. Metaphorically, a throne can be deadly. Anyone who takes up that much power immediately has dozens of targets on their back. But imagine if it was the throne itself that killed you, literally. Bela I of Hungary did everything he could to get onto the throne. His father, Prince Vazul, had to rebel against his own father to get the throne, though instead he was captured and blinded. So, Bela and his siblings fled until his eldest brother successfully seized the crown. As per tradition, in Hungary, the crown was supposed to be passed from brother to brother, but instead, Bella's brother's son was named heir. So Bella organized an army in Poland, marched on Hungary, killed his brother on the throne, and took up his reign. He actually accomplished much in his reign, including crushing a pagan rebellion and asserting Hungarian independence. But then, in 1063, as Bella was walking up to his throne in front of a bunch of officials and sat down, the whole throne collapsed. The accident left him severely injured and he died from his injuries later on. His throne literally killed him. Number three, Valyrian. The words molten gold and Game of Thrones evokes a specific image for those who have seen the show, but did you know that they may have been inspired by the real life death of Roman Emperor Valyrian? Many rumors as to how Emperor Valyrian actually met his fate kind of range, but either way, it wasn't a good end. According to Lactantius, Persian King Shapur I captured Valyrian in battle and tormented him without mercy. He used him as a footstool, mocked him, flayed him with straw, but the most vicious was the rumor that he met his end by having molten gold poured down his throat. Another is that he was just kept in imprisonment until he eventually faded away into nothingness. His own son didn't even try to rescue his father after he was captured due to humiliation, but also because he was trying to hold back a rebellion. What officially happened to the emperor we may never know, but whatever it was, it wasn't good. It wasn't good. Number two, Georgi Doza. This is definitely the most brutal on the list, so warnings ahead. This dude was literally torn to shreds by people. I wish that was a metaphor, but it's not. Georgi Doza was a Transylvanian nobleman who led a Hungarian peasant rebellion against their lords. He went down in history as both a criminal and a Christian martyr. He was appointed by Pope Leo X to lead a crusade against the Ottoman with an army of 40,000 volunteers, mostly peasants. The nobles failed to supply the crusaders with what they needed, and soon the peasants began to revolt against the nobles. Doza agreed with their grievances and organized a massive rebellion that led to all out war against the nobles. Noble manors were ransacked, nobles were tormented and unalived, but soon the aristocracy began crushing back the rebellion, and 70,000 rebels were tormented to death. But Georgi got it the worst. He was first forced to sit in a hot chair with a hot crown fixed upon his head, and then nine of his followers who were starved before this were forced to. Um, well, let's just say, make a meal out of him. 
yeah, not good, not good. We don't like that. Number one, William the Conqueror. Just recently, I went to see one of my favorite comedians, Eddie Izzard, and through her show, I learned that William the Conqueror exploded. <laughs> he exploded! I couldn't believe it, so I had to look it up, and yup, it's true, folks. We have not one, but two people on this list that exploded internally. William ate as much as he conquered. Not only was he a glutton for land, he was also for the finer things in life, the finest foods, and the spoils of war. As a result, the Duke of Normandy grew in impressive size. In 1087, while riding his horse, it reared unexpectedly, and due to his size, he was unable to balance, and the saddle pushed so hard into his abdomen that his intestines were punctured. Doctors didn't have the means to perform surgery due to his size and their tech, so eventually the king succumbed to his injuries, dying six weeks later. Six weeks? That's a long time. But it doesn't end there. Oh no! He was so disliked that his corpse was abandoned until a wandering knight took on the deed. By the time his body finally arrived in Cannes to be buried, it had been weeks. The bacteria festered in his intestines, filling his body with putrid gas, and as the gravediggers were lowering him into his grave, the hole was too small to fit his now inflamed massive corpse, so they tried to squeeze him in by like jumping and pressing, and in typical Monty Python fashion, he burst and exploded all over the crowd. So no, he didn't die by explosion, but kind of internally, and then again. So. It counts, but what a weird way to go, and what an even weirder way to be buried. And that was our somewhat darker Bumblebee list of the top 10 unusual ways that ancient rulers died. 